no, I guess one podcast really can make a difference. Okay. Enough that's said. What, that's what you wanted to do. I that's... want to. I had I was debating a couple things. Okay. There's this whole monologue at the opening cuz I did that for I know, but it it feels very strange that there's yeah, that he comes back to that for this. Yeah. What well, happens at the beginning of two as well? Does it? Yeah, yeah. Like but uh, yeah. but the one here is not. It's me, Peter Parker, your friendly neighborhood. <laughs> you know, I've come a long way since I was the boy bit by a spider. Back then, nothing seemed to go right for me. Now people really like me. The city is safe and sound. Guess I had a little something to do with that. My uncle Ben would be proud. I still go to school. Wait, you're just doing my a class, like, Stop it. And I'm Wait in love. I don't want you to do With the this. podcast of my dreams. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> that is a moment where I remember just seeing this in theaters, opening yeah. day, time, uh, not Times Square, uh, Lincoln Square, IMAX. IMAX. Took my sister. Mm -hmm. uh, what, she must have been like nine eight, at this point? Eight or nine, yeah. Yeah, these movies are a big thing that we shared. We're both wearing Spider-Man t-shirts. Everyone's fucking amped. And that monologue starts. I'm like, this is going on a little too long. <laughs> right. Like it was just one of those immediate moments of like a little slight deflation, <laughs> just a little slight deflation. Just go, okay, I'll grant him this. Today we are talking about Spider-Man Three. Spider-Man Three. Spider-Man Three. The battle within. The battle within. That was the uh, the tagline. The battle within begins. I, I just see the battle May. within. I go, oh, well, maybe there was a uh huh, right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, there, I remember the iconic drop of the first poster. The, Huge. This one, right? Where it was like, wait, is this in black and white? Or is, wait, what? That was the thing. The poster came out everyone went, oh, moody. And then Sony went, by the way, that poster's in color. <laughs> that, yes, I remember Ain't that. Ain't it cool exploded? Yes. Um, we're here to talk about Sam Raimi's Spider-Man 3. See it in IMAX, Griffin. You did. I did. Uh, the end of Sam Raimi's Spider-Man trilogy. Yes. And, and I think almost was, unintentionally. Well, that's what's weird is I think everyone viewed at the time as like, he's going to finish the Spider-Man trilogy. I and then very so. shortly afterwards, it became clear that he was like, I want to keep making these, right. especially after this one. Yeah. I really want to keep making them. I don't think I ever thought of this as the conclusion to a trilogy. It doesn't, feel like, it doesn't feel like one. It feels it's maybe the conclusion of the Harry Osborn. That's trilogy. the thing right. that made it right. feel like a conclusion. And I think McGuire's salary but it's was not going... a conclusion to Spider-Man's story so in the up. slightest. No, no, no. Although not that I, there needs to be a conclusion. No, to the I story. do like right. the messiness of the of the ending. Uh, it's a conclusion of the Harry Osborn arc. Absolutely. I think, you know, we just did the um, Batman Forever commentary yesterday for Patreon. Absolutely. And we were talking about that's the last moment when the idea of these franchises, maybe you just treat them like James Bond and you never have to hit the reset button. Right. If you lose cast members. Fine. You bring just, someone else in. Whatever. Who cares? You keep the same supporting cast. You dump characters off at the side. Who gives a, a shit? There's a new girlfriend every time. Which I will say, I think there's a lot to be said for that approach. I there think there's absolutely. a lot to be said for sort of not being so precious about this stuff. Well, because the uh, alternate thing is that you do have to start being like okay well so there's a multiverse because it's the only way mm -hmm. you can deal with a 30 entry series right. that has to maintain continuity right, like, right. You, know, you have to be like uh yeah well sure that guy died but he needs to come back so uh we're gonna pull him out of this dimension or whatever you know there, whatever there's that thing do. of like you know judy dench signs a five movie deal they get rid of pierce brosnan three movies in they're like, well, we just keep her. Yeah. And here's a new franchise, a new start, a reset with the beginning of his career. And everyone went, look, this seems to confirm this fan theory that was long held that James Bond is a title. It is not a proper name. It goes along with 007. All of these guys are different people. And then Skyfall actually goes out of its way to show, like, the gravestone of his parents and be like, Mary... Sure. And Fred, <laughs> Bond. Yeah, are those Fred the actual names, Bond. or it could be anything? Yeah. You know, like uh, right. Janice but, and Rogers Bond. But for how much, like the you know the Craig series is so much more trying to play the game of like tight chronology and serialized storytelling more. and everything. It still remains the only franchise that is just like we, we just move along. Yeah, I admire that. I like that. I, I do too. I like that. And I, I think it is now hard to remember, as insane as this is to say, even just a little over a decade later, mm -hmm. how insane it felt when the announcement came out. Sony is hitting the big red button. They're sending Peter Parker back to high school. They're restarting the entire cycle. You're right. It was insane at the time. Now it might even feel less insane yeah. just because we're so used to all this stuff. But I do remember at the time the thing I like, 
10 years is not long enough to be presenting me no. with a new Spider-Man. No, like, and, yeah, and, yeah. and like three years from when the last one came out. Right. And well, they had a release date for four announced. It wait. comes out five years after. It comes out right? five years, right. Where they right. announced But it, I think it was right. two or three years after. And the headline was, Peter Parker is going back to high school. And we're all like, like phew! But the thing I they were centralizing was, we feel like he's best as a teenager. We got out of high school too quickly in the Raimi trilogy. Do you read comics, Jamel? You, you read I do read comics, comics yeah. Like, yeah. Do you remember, oh, I'm sorry, introduce her, show our guest, and then I have a question for Jamel. About Absolutely. This. this is a podcast called Blank Check with Griffin and David. I'm Griffin. I'm David. Good job there. You did, a, it was very, it was so fast I almost couldn't right, hear it. Right, 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 right. Like it's a Doppler effect. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's a podcast about filmographies, directors who have massive success early on in their careers and are given a series of blank checks, make whatever crazy passion projects they want. Sometimes those checks clear, and sometimes they bounce, baby. Sometimes they swing also. Um, mm -hmm. This is a mini series on the films of Sam Raimi. Mm -hmm. It's called Podcast Me to Hell. And today we're talking about what inarguably has to be viewed as his biggest bounce. I think, I think within so. the cultural legacy of his career. And it's probably the thing that the the film that's the most interesting in the arc of his career. If you're talking yes. just about the external arc of his career, right? And a movie that he has openly talked about, kind of breaking him, not being able to get over. Sure, right. The reception to it, right? Uh, it's called Spiderman Three, as we said. Our guest today is one of the smartest men on the planet, Jamal Bowie of the New York Times and Unclear and Present Danger. Who I just want to say, one of the it's either on the Reddit or some message board thread that I saw when we announced Raimi. People go, holy shit, does this mean we're finally going to get Jamel's Spider-Man 3 is good take? I think Which you, you've, you know, but this was the, you put out on the internet. You hadn't tweeted anything about this miniseries, but people just put the threads together and they said, I know there's this Jamel Bowie Spider-Man 3 is actually good take that exists in the ether that has never been fully unpacked. This podcast seems to finally be providing the perfect landing place for that. Now, David has always contended that he hates this movie. That's not true. Not hate, but don't like. I don't like it. I've always been like, I, I think there's good stuff in it. I think that movie gets kind of a bad rap. I, certainly, I don't think it works, but I think there's really good stuff in it that I like, and I, I prefer it to most superhero movies. Well, even more the, coherent, tighter. That's the thing. Yes. I would always give you that in, in any debate where I'm like, obviously it's a true original versus I just what do the think over the become. years I've had to push I don't more like it. on. I, I don't know. like it. You you have always taken the stance of this movie's good. I think it's a good movie. Yeah. I think that it is obviously not it does not compare to Spider-Man 2, mm -hmm. but what does, right? Spider-Man 2 is I think still sort of like the great height of this entire genre. I um, agree. Yeah. And pretty much. Yep. But rel I think I think it I think it, having watched before we're speaking I watched all these sort of night after night mm -hmm. back to back. And when you watch Spider-Man Three, like two days after watching this first Spider-Man, the drop off in quality isn't really that. It's not really there. I mean, there are I parts. I don't agree with that. There are no. parts of Spider-Man Three which do not work, and I will acknowledge yeah. that. Yes. And I, but I think overall, taking 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 this entire package, I think it's a good movie. I look. I still. I I, fin I finished watching it last night, and I said I had a good time with this. I I go two uh, two one three, with quite a golf. I feel like that's. The popular ranking, right? Right. Sure. But I do think the drop-off is, as you said, less severe than it was in my mind's eye. I think time has been a little kind to this movie. It has. In ways that now we are so warped by what superhero movies are that this film feels oddly quaint for a movie that was like the epitome of overstuff. Bloat! Too right. many villains! Right. Too much going on. I, right. I, think, I, think, I think what one of the things that renders it um, quaint is that... And we were just talking about the the Garfield, Andrew Garfield, Mark Webb, Spider-Man movies, um, Mark Webb. And uh, Amazing Spider-Man 2 mm -hmm. is also over stuff, but not just with villains and characters, but with lore. Yes. It's sort of like it's weighed down by having to explain. That movie feels desperate. Right. right, where right. It, and it's trying very quickly. It's sort of like what Batman versus Superman does as well, where they're just sort of like, uh, let's play some videos. Aquaman, the fight. You right. know, like we're just right. like we need to lay some track for all the shit we gotta right. do. But Amazing yeah. Spider-Man Spider Two 3. is both trying to like course correct for what people didn't like about Amazing Spider-Man One and continue the threads that they didn't really successfully <laughs> right and, and set like, up seven side movies right, right. right and kind of go back to Raimi vibes. But Spider-Man kind of. Three, SM3. it's overstuffed in the sense that there are there is, there's one too many villains. Yeah. But generally speaking, this is a pretty small scale story, right? Like it like is. the previous That's two movies, the thing. this is a movie about Peter Parker, Mary Jane Watson, and Harry Osborn. Yep. And I think the fact that it is still very 
focused on these three characters and their relationships is what huge, makes it work. Huge and what asset. Makes it, and, and what makes it stand out even in comparison to the MCU. This is my whole thing. So I was always just like, look, as the way I was putting it to David, you know, I, I think I rewatched this maybe like two or three years ago. And then last night I watched the editor's cut, which have you ever seen? I've not seen. Okay, so I have some things to say about that as well. But my defense of it was sort of like, it's like a lesser Vincent Minnelli or Stanley Donen musical. Mm -hmm. It's like watching a kind of perfunctory MGM musical from the golden age that doesn't really hang together. But like the fucking sequences that work are still just so bravura and well made that I greatly prefer that to anything else. And it's got charm and it's got style and all that sort of stuff. But watching it this time, I was just taken by, and, and let's just say, David, we saw Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness last night. We did. I literally did a back-to-back -back Sam Raimi double feature. Sure. Of I did I just the other way around. Yeah. And it is like kind of astonishing comparison to watch that this movie, for as much as the fundamental problem of it is Venom, New Goblin, and Sandman are three different movies, and they never figure out how to like collate them into one story. The fundamental thread is incredibly clear and straightforward, which is just the Harry, Peter, Mary Jane thing. And I like that I can just fucking hang on to that. What was the question you were going to ask Jamel? I was going to ask Jamel if he remembered Brand New Day. One, more, actually, one more day, yeah. Brand New Day. Yeah. Which was the comic book Hate. version. Huh? Hated it. Right. Which was the comic book version of what you're talking about, yes. though, where they were like, Spider-Man, there's just not something working about this. And it's a common writer complaint, I think, going yep. back way, because that was the Clone Saga was kind of about right. that, too, where it's like, can we uncouple him from Mary Jane? She's yep. not an interesting character. Their marriage is not interesting. He's become a stagnant character. And they would, the Clone Saga was, they were like, what if we do this? And someone else becomes Peter Parker. And someone else becomes right. Spider-Man. And fans were like, no! And they were like, all right, <laughs> sorry! <You> know, like. <laughs> Ultimate Spider-Man is huge, which for those who don't know, it was like in between X-Men and the first Spider-Man movie, Marvel goes, we need to have a comic book on shelves that has like clean continuity, is an entry point. And he's not fucking married to Mary Jane. Anymore. For both yes. X-Men and Spider-Man, yeah, where it's yeah, like, yeah. let's but, have this basically resemble the right. status quo of the movies that they're going to see. And then those are huge. Those are huge. And those are good. The, the Bendis Ultimate Spider-Man run is very good. Right. And then Raimi is so focused on the love story thing that I think they're like, there has to be some element of him chasing a girl that's working in Ultimate. It's working in the movies. Sure. And in Amazing, he's a happily married he's, school teacher. Right, right. And so... One more day is this preposterous way for them to break. Do you remember enjoying that, hating that? Because I definitely did not like it. I did not like it. I, no. I, it, it, it Mephisto steals their yeah. marriage as a price for saving Aunt May's yeah. life. Ben, yes. the premise here is that Aunt May is going to die and Spider-Man's like, give her one more day. And Mephisto, who's essentially Marvel Satan, is like, I'll keep your elderly probably close to death anyway. 80-something. Yeah, like alive. If right. you let me rewrite the timeline so that you are never married to fucking Mary Jane and you don't know And her. Peter Parker's like, why? And he's like, I just love your marriage. Nom, 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 nom. Yeah, like, it doesn't really marriage. make sense. So convoluted. Right. A, a weird thing in Marvel lore is that basically all gods and mythology right. are true. If it, if, it's if, all if real. It, it's all real. It's like, yeah, you heard of Norse gods. They live on a planet somewhere. You heard of Mephisto. Yeah, he's a guy. He's got like fire hey, hair I mean, and a tall collar. He sits on a bone throne. Right. He's, oh, fuck. Yeah. <laughs> oh, shit. Damn, he's legit. Yeah. Oh, fuck. But he's no good. He's no good. You don't want to get tangled up with him. Yeah, but he's just like, I love you being single. And they're like, why? And they're like, because Marvel editor-in-chief Joe Casada thinks it's more relatable <laughs> to young readers. It's funny. A couple years later, they did another, I guess not a couple, four or five years later, they did another kind of big reboot that worked much better. And that was the Superior Spider-Man. Yes. Right. Where, where when, Dr. When, Octopus is put into his body. Right. right. A yes. thing that on its face, people were like, this is fucking horrible. People were initially horrified. Right. right. But yeah. it really does work. Because it works. It, it, it shakes up the status quo. And it's about like, what is is heroic about Spider-Man. Right. Right. It, it's very similar to um, Stark Deconstructed, which is like one of my favorite Iron Man mm. arcs, which, Ben, if you don't know the premise of this one, it is, um, it's someone, it's like someone is stealing the Iron Man technology, as often happens. And so what- uh, As man Stark, is wont to do. As, what Tony Stark does is he basically sort of like, he goes from place to place, not just deleting the information, deleting the part of his mind that contains it. And so like he's eternal sun shining. He's himself. literally deconstructing his mind over time. And the whole story is like, what, what actually makes Tony Stark, Tony Stark, what makes Iron Man, Iron Man. And it's a really smart 
like take on the character. Comic books those, are so good. Those are always the best. Yeah, comic books fucking. And rule. is the comic interior of his mind kind of? It's both. It's, it's both. both. Yeah. Okay. That sounds really interesting. But that's always like the best. I I I feel like so often the best uh, uh, superhero arcs, the ones that linger with us, are the ones where a writer comes in with a radical idea to just go like, I want to answer the fundamental question. Who is this guy and what makes them special? Batman R.I.P. Yes. It, these are all kind of actually concurrent. They're all kind of happening right, it's all at the same mid-2000s. time. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah, and yeah, yeah, yeah. like, yeah. I would argue all the best superhero movies try to do that same thing. Like they treat it like an outside the box arc where it's like, we have to fundamentally test this character and why they are this person and right. why they do this and, and all of that. I will say as someone who only really kind of casually read comics. Sure. The continuity thing was such like I was like, where where is this story? What's happening? That, that it was, was so hard to yeah. get into it. Ben, the ultimate thing was they were like, you can buy a comic book. It's called Ultimate Spider Man issue number one. It takes place in the year two thousand. Peter Parker's in high school. He gets bitten by a bug, and the whole point was like, <laughs> you can go to the yes, shelves. But but what happened to them? What happened is over five years, yeah. eventually it became the same problem. Just as convoluted. Right. right. <laughs> they had to start undoing yeah. things because it so, was the exact same thing. They they just build up continuity, and now they've just done that. With and the then movie guess what franchise. happens? Yeah, and they were like, "All yes. right, forget the ultimate thing." But then Ultimate Spider-Man can go live in the regular world. Right. They only made it more complicated right. at the end of the day. They start right. smushing right. everything right. together. No, but, that's, but yes, Ben, that is exactly what happened with the movies, where they like made the movies a clean entry point, and now the movies are constantly playing this gambit of like, "Is this going to make sense if I haven't seen the twenty-seven other things? <laughs> Do I need to have watched the entire show?" And so far, uh, it continues to work for them. Yeah, But I do wonder if there will be that point that has happened in every wave of comics where it just goes like, this is impossible to enter into, or if streaming services essentially have negated that being an issue. If like viewer habits and just the fact that now all of it is just on one site makes it so that people go like, my project for the year is I'm just going to watch all of this and catch up. I think it will continue to work as long as the writers and creators and everyone remembers that the lore isn't the point yes right like as soon as you this was sort of i mean the dc stuff is is much more you know short there's not as much of it but this was the essential problem with all of that it was like the lore was the point it was sort of like it was all about you know what was the backstory how are these things connected or whatnot but if you can just tell a straightforward story and like drop some sprinkles to other things for people to kind of grab onto if they care that that means it can, you can it, it's fine. Look, when people want to ding Feige for this being done in a way that feels a little bit uh, vacuous or, or sort of like uh, insincere or whatever, you can. But it is it remains the superpower of those movies and their like hold on the culture is that they keep focused on let's make these characters charming to people. Let's isolate what the right. characteristics yeah. they like are, what's funny about this actor, give actors good showcases that they'll let them show their personality and build up relationships and all that sort of shit. Spider-Man 3. Spider-Man 3. Which came out in 2007. It's written by Sam Raimi, mm-hmm. Ivan Raimi, and Alvin Sargent. Yeah. It's about Spider-Man. A 15-year-old movie. It's a 15-year-old movie. That's right. And we've it's had 15 years old. This Six uh, movies in that May. time with so Spider-Man in tomorrow. the Tomorrow. 15 years old tomorrow. 15 years old tomorrow. Six. Six. You have two Garfields, three Hollands, and, and Into the Spider-Verse. Into the Spider-verse. Six solo Spider-Man movies in the 15 years since this. Now, People th- like this guy. Three different characters. Yeah. I'll say, I mean, of those six movies. Three different portrayals, yeah. Spider-Verse really feels like the only thing that's done something like genuinely exciting. Yep. I would agree with that. Yep. Um, yep. Uh, yeah. 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 I know. I mean, like you say six movies, but then also Tom Holland plays Spider-Man in an additional three movies right right and so. we have two more spider verses on the way two yeah. more spider verses on the way and no doubt there will be a more tom holland's on the way yeah and of course recently we met uh, an md by the name of michael morbius, oh, michael morbius. i hope this guy doesn't make house calls <laughs> I, hear, I hear i hear he's a, a living vampire <laughs> he this is the thing with this guy. he ain't dead you can check his pulse and you'll hear it all right tap uh, tap and we met venom we did um, meet venom and we met carnage vulture and Met Paul Vultures around let, let, let there be carnage. We let there. We did in we fact let carnage let be there. That's on us. <laughs> you know, we did. <laughs> Truly, I I feel that's like, why you have to vote. That's okay? why you have to vote. Gotta, <laughs> we're letting there be carnage. That's right that's why you have to vote. A uh, very cynical joke by me. But in Spider Man Three, there had only been two other Spider Man movies, yes. and that was it. Yep. And so the plot is that Peter Parker is Spider Man. Mary mm-hmm. Jane Watson knows that he is Spider Man, mm-hmm. and they are together. Yeah. She's an actress. Yeah. Of sort of slightly 
amorphous fame. I'm not really like, is she Broadway star or is she a nobody? Like, uh, look, a I, here's what I would equate her to. I would almost say she's at like a Tavi Gevinson level or like Tavi like 10 years ago where you're like, here's someone who's kind of famous and then they're doing Broadway shows and people are doubting them and they're quitting themselves slightly better than people imagined. Um, they're not maybe known by the public at large. Right. I'm just going to try and very quickly do the plot of this movie. Like, like just the order what the setup of this yeah, movie Good is. luck. Right. Spider-Man is Spider-Man. He is Spider-Man. People like him. It's going great. Yeah. He's yeah. on an upswing. People, right. are, People losing, are generally their minds about Spider-Man. Spider-Man. Right. Yeah. yeah. Which is right. maybe the reason why the second the movie starts, I was like, this feels wrong. It does feel wrong. It Spider-Man feels should wrong. never be popular. Right. right. He should always be kind of like one step behind. Blah, blah, yeah. blah. And uh, he is greeted with three problems that kind of just come at him in a sort of like do, 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 do. Like they never really unite, but three villains. Yes. His old buddy, Harry Osborn. Even Osborne. when all three villains are on screen at the same time at the really end of the movie, they other. never <laughs> yeah. feel like they're in the same film. <laughs> it is. Really. I mean, I guess we'll get to it, David, but I have to say, I mean, one of the villains, Venom, is literally introduced via a meteor that comes into frame, mm-hmm. disconnected from everything happening in the movie. Yes. It just yes. happens it, to happen. It's almost like a producer just kind of lobbed it from on screen <laughs> and it landed on the script. This movie, look, it, it absolutely has a lot of, coincidences strong coincidences that need to line up for anything to happen sure and so rather than you know character action right so there's the the villain we would all expect harry has decided to become a new green goblin the new goblin what he's the new goblin he's got kind he's of avenging a, him yeah right he's got kind of a snow uh not, not a major glider more of a sort of snowboardy yep. glider uh-huh wasn't there a character called Hobgoblin? Yep. There was. Yes. They never do Hobgoblin. Is he was is he connected to? Yes. Yeah, when but Hobgoblin kind of a it's, it's them trying to repeat the original mystery yeah. of Green Goblin. Because when Green Goblin was introduced, part of it was like, who is the Green Goblin? Right, yeah. right, right. And so Hobgoblin, it was a lot of like, who could this be? Ho- Hobgoblin was like a copycat. He was Harry a copy. He just it. had. He was like eighty percent more pumpkiny. He was like right. the same. Well, that's thing what with I loved about pumpkin. him. Yeah, I was like, kind of almost like, wait, am I gonna get some fucking? But then there's also what's his name, Mad Jack. Yeah, there were so many Mad go- Jack was goblin-y like guys. All fucking pumpkin thing. <laughs> right. He, pumpkin for a head. Like Gosh. he's like fucking like a skeleton. Um it's a great but, choice. But Harry on his part. became a green goblin too. Right. He's Green Goblin okay. the second. And then there's order. Demo Goblin. Goblin yeah. Jr. Mm-hmm. as Peter. Ned Leeds them. becomes Demo Goblin or became one of the other fucking goblins. I don't know. Um there were a lot of goblins. But but canonically in the comics, when Harry becomes the goblin, he is the new green goblin. Right. He's not the new goblin. He puts on the fucking. He takes the mantle on. Yeah. So, so he doesn't got, read. We got Harry Goblin. Harry, as much Harry, as Harry Goblin. Harry Goblin. We've got the Sandman, mm-hmm. who, of course, is not just a man of sand, but it turns out is the murderer of Uncle Ben. Uh huh. And then later in the movie, we have Eddie Brock, yes. rival photographer, who right. later in the movie becomes Venom. Yeah. So those are three things that are happening. And they're like. Kind of in parallel. Th- yes. They are kind of three complete attempts at in microcosm three, three columns here's three a villain silos. here's what their deal is here's how they relate to peter parker's journey and this is the arc that they have with each other right it's like three complete movies that are all smushed together and i think i think you could have if you took out venom i think you'd have a movie that works better if, if you took out Certainly. sandman i think you'd have a movie that works better. i think two I out of three they could have pulled off i think you can pull off two of those villains in part because they all, I mean, they all have like thematic resonance. Yeah. Like they're not just, it's not just a villain for the sake of a villain necessarily. Right? Yeah. Like Eddie Absolutely. Brock is sort of what if Peter Parker were even a, a bigger shit. Right. And like, how would that manifest itself? The Harry stuff is self-explanatory. And Sandman is sort of like, you know, op- offers an opportunity for what you saw in Spider-Man 2, which is a villain conflict that's resolved not by Peter Parker beating the shit out of someone. Right. But by something internal to him, relating him, to him the overcoming humanity, right? yeah. a thing about himself. Th- this is the whole thing. They with are this very movie. similar, art, right? Because right. Do- Doctor Octopus is the same. Where it's like, what does he want to do? He wants to like rob a bank. You know, it doesn't really matter what he wants. It's no. all about he needs to overcome, right. or he needs to reach the conclusion of this internal arc that he I, is I, going. I think all three of these things in microcosm work on paper, and I think any one of these three options is valid as an approach for what you do for Spider Man Three. And it's fine to have two villains. I, I mean, think two yeah. would have worked. I right. also think if if it had been one, and even if the one he did was Avirod forcing Venom on him or Sony forcing Goblin on him rather than Sandman, which is clearly the one he wants to do the most, I think if it was just focused on one of them, he could have completely nailed this. Yeah. Even the Venom movie, I think if actually given space, although it's the one he clearly 
wants but to do this, the least. Yeah, it is. I think there's something there that he could have made work. Well, I think is, when you get to like a meteor falls from a sky and happens to land on his bike and then follows him back to his apartment, like all the things in the movie that are totally weird and slapdash and rush and whatever come from them just being like, how do we do all of these at the same time? It just fucking just grant us this shortcut. And the movie takes so many shortcuts that by the end, you're just kind of like... You could very easily imagine, right, like a Venom-centric movie that kind of carries on with Mary Jane's uh, yes. former fiance, right? Yes. Who is who is an astronaut? So right. yes. that gives you that. But it, he's Man Wolf. Come on now. He's <laughs> now if they'd done Man Wolf. Yeah. Sorry. Go on. Um, no, and I think there's I think there's a Venom. Not just what you're saying about him being a little bit of a shit, but the the Frank Grimes of it I think is yes. a little interesting. Yeah. These first two movies have presented Peter Parker as being such a sad sack and so bottom of the barrel. Everything's so hard for him. And to have someone show up who's like, nothing works for me. I didn't get bit by a fucking spider. Right. The girl doesn't end up with me. It's like, pains. the thing I like the most in, in the Eddie Brock uh, plotline in this is that he and Gwen never really have a relationship. And right. he's just like, no, she's going to come around to me. I like that. But it also makes no sense and is sort of baffling from... I like it in that it, it In execution. Me. Right. In execution, right. it just feels like... I just but remember I think you in could do the, the whole theater. Grimesy... Here's, yeah. Look, right. Real quick, David, I, just, Please, I want to ask you something ahead. about, no, about the ahead. Eddie Brock arc. Um, so uh, the thing that really breaks Eddie Brock is that he plagiarizes a photo and Peter Parker catches him and like kind which of... Is, which is the it. sort of classic uh, comic book origin story for him, right? Would, would you have read it up, Brock? Hmm. Watching it, now, like, 12 years into being a journalist. I'm Two like, yeah, journalists. Fuck that guy. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> and he's, like, so craven. Yeah. Like, and, like, it's it's also... It's, craven de summer de <laughs> Hello! Hello! <laughs> the biggest game of all is in Central Park! No, um, I really wish they had done Craven. I know, I know Raimi wanted to do him. Yeah. Um, Eddie Brock doesn't make a lot of sense in this movie no. in any way, right? Like, but it's what you're talking about where he shows up and he's like, ha, I'm pretty cool. Like, you know, I want a staff job. And he forges a photo and all that. And Spider-Man's like, you made this up? And he's like, please, man. I got nothing else. Like, like he immediately flips to life. But his, I don't have any prospects. His entire arc needs to happen in essentially four That's scenes. That's the problem. So yeah. when, when Peter is mean apart to him, from each other. you're like, yes. Peter is honestly almost doing, even if Peter wasn't yeah. a dick after this, he's doing uh, J. Jonah Jameson a favor here. Right, it's like, this right. guy is so bad that he immediately resorted but to this. But that's why I bring up the Frank Grimes thing, because I just think there could be a thing where there's like, uh, death by a thousand paper cuts. He continues to embarrass this guy leading up to the big moment. Right, the, that there's more of a rivalry. I right. mean, look, this is the problem. As we all know, and we will, I can get into a little more, but I think a lot of people know, Raimi yeah. wanted to do a, a movie with the Sandman yes. and Harry Osborn. And Avi Arad was like, Sam, the fans demand Venom. I'm doing a Transylvanian yes. accent for an Israeli guy. I don't know why. <laughs> um, blah, blah, blah. I like, yeah, yeah. Blah, but blah, like, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. But right, like, you know, Venom is crowbarred in. But then, of course, Venom actually becomes crucial to both the theme of the movie, which yeah. is like Peter wrestling with Dark his darker side. side. Right. 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 To the advertising in the movie, the black suit and the everything. whole fucking thing. Yeah. So you're going into this movie being like, all Venom. right, okay, this right. is like a Venom movie. And then the movie is like so uninterested in yeah. that for most of the plot. The, the other thing is for what it's And it doesn't know what to do with Venom when he's Venom no, right. at no. all. Like that is the worst failing. He's almost yes. more interesting as Eddie Brock. It, it, uh, it's obviously Raimi was less resistant to the Harry Goblin stuff than right. the Venom stuff, but the Goblin stuff was also sort of prioritized by Sony. Like he was really? like, well, I but want he classic wanted to villain. finish the right. He the did, but Osborne I think Sony arc, was right. like, he really needs to like, we need to fill this. I think a lot of the design elements were like, th there were sort His of design is kind of lazy, but it feels very Sony like yeah. hip. PlayStation 3 kind right, of right. like that's what he yeah. feels like right. yeah. it's not like horrifying but it does feel it's funny that this isn't your daddy's goblin I, I right. it's funny that the Willem Dafoe goblin, goblin is so poppy and strange right. and that the, the James Franco goblin is just like I don't know he's wearing that's, a ski mask the vibe I've yeah. always gotten is like Raimi obviously wanted to complete a hairy arc but in execution a lot of how New Goblin manifests was Sony Ziskin stuff and then a rod is all about there has to be a new there suit, must be there has venom. to be venom, you have to do symbiotes. Right. And Raimi's like, I just want to do another, like, I want to do another 60s villain who, you know, wants to steal a big bat of money, but he's also got a heart. Like, right. That's what Raimi loves. Yes. That's the only thing he cares about. You, really. you can you can see that in the movie, too, that there's that scene where Sandman is, before he's 
the Sandman right. is talking with his estranged wife, and it's yeah. like it's like a you know it's, it's like quiet domestic. It's scene. like truly Teresa like out of a Russell. 50s crime movie, right? right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Where you're like, I know this guy's gonna have to go back to jail, but I'm also gonna be like, ah, you know, and he's gonna be played by like Gene Turney or whatever, it's, right? But the fact that it's Teresa Russell, like yeah, transgressive yeah, yeah. Nicholas Rogue. Gene Turney. Andre. What am I talking about? Glenn Ford, not Gene Turney. Sorry, Gene Turney's a woman. Yeah, it um, it is that look like. We, we will talk about Doctor Strange soon, sure. right? But Doctor Strange is a movie that uh, has to contend with like five different plot lines. And this a lot is of why different... everyone was worried. They were like, yeah. Jesus, oh, Raimi was overwhelmed by one extra villain on three. How's he going right. to handle the MCU? Right. Now, watching that movie, and we will talk about it, there are threads in that movie I care about significantly less than other threads. And when they would cut to them, I'd be like, okay, just, just on with it, on with it, on with it. But that movie does feel more cohesive in the sense that like, it is more successful at weaving them on a regular basis that you're not losing track of one. Whereas this movie will focus on like one of the guys and one yeah. of those threads and how they mirror Peter Parker for 20 minutes. And then when it cuts back to the other guy, you're like, I forgot yeah. that he was in this movie. And it's like he exists. He has three separate arcs in different ways relating to each of the three. Flint guys. Marco. But yes, you have, you have the Raimi camp, you have the Sony camp, you have the Marvel camp. And they're all trying to fulfill different things. And as Raimi puts it, I mean, we're going to just dig into this for a lot of the episode. He has this line I always think about where he said, like, the first movie, I couldn't believe they hired me. Right. I went in with this pitch. I did not think it was hip or sexy. I was not anyone's first choice. And I couldn't believe they hired me to make the movie and that they pretty much let me make the movie I had in my head. And then the second movie comes around and they let me do even more. They gave me even more freedom. I felt like I totally understood what I was doing, and it went over even better, and I couldn't believe it. And the third movie, everyone said, now, wait a second, we have some notes. <laughs> right. Like, the third movie, suddenly people said, and he's talked about that it was just, like, they started doing the calculations of how much was resting upon this movie. Right. That's and whereas, the problem. The films had already been selling toys, been selling soundtracks, been selling fucking everything, DVDs out the wazoo. Suddenly, they were like, could we make more? Can we, can we come up with an algorithm to make more? And the analogy he says that I feel like now describes how most of these movies are made. And at the time, I was like, that's tragic. Why would anyone put someone in this position? But it's all of these films now. He was like, they essentially, I was like on a helicopter or I was on an airplane. And they said, here's your release date. And they handed me a bunch of fabric and a thread and a needle and pushed me out the plane and said, good luck making your own parachute before you hit the ground. I I think it's the disease of more with these things, yeah. right? Where it's like they can't just be happy with making a hundreds of millions of dollars in profit. Right. The, the, right. This is the thing that I've always struggled to understand. Like it, it it's it would, it would have been one thing had Spider Man two been a big flop, right? But Spider Man two, like, okay, okay, yeah, hey right. buddy, yeah, yeah, yeah. But Sp Spider Man two makes like ten percent less than Spider Man one, but is beloved. I don't think anyone was complaining of the drop off. I think especially at that time sequels always did better than the first movie by and large and people were like you mean worse. yeah the first one was a phenomenon right you, you mean worse yes no. i'm sorry sequels usually had yeah. a slight drama yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. it made pretty much the same amount of money and was beloved and sold a thousand fucking t-shirts and whatever right. and even still they were just like what more could we be yeah and i i think there was also this thing mcguire goes from getting like whatever it was like two million dollars on the first movie and then for the second movie it blows up he is off filming Seabiscuit. His agents come back and they're like, he wants $20 million. And Sony balked and they were like, fuck you. We're going to hire Jake Gyllenhaal. Right. <laughs> or he said, he said, I want 20. They said, we're not giving you 20. And he went, oh, my back, my back hurts. I right. can't do the movie. They went, we're calling your bluff. We'll hire Jake Gyllenhaal. They brought Gyllenhaal in for like a meeting. And he came back and they were like, we'll do it for 12.5. 17.5. For two or for three? Uh, for this, no, he made less. Really? He made $15 million, but 7.5% of the okay. gross. That's the thing. I think the other thing of this movie getting overstuffed... Means that his total gross, his total earnings on this movie were about $60 million. Insane. Just FYI. Insane. Which is great. Insane. Yeah, it's a good amount of money. Yeah. I, I do think that's part of the manic rush to put as much in this movie as possible. Is there like, are we going to not be able to afford Toby anymore? Yeah. Is there a point where his deal is going to become so insane? It's like, what happened with Depp and the Pirates of the Caribbean movies? Where they were like, even just the depth of it all aside, they were like, we can't make these movies without this guy. And in order to lure him back every time, we have to offer him 25% of the gross. Like, it just becomes unreasonable. Do we want to reset him? At the very least, we want to resolve this fucking Harry, Mary, Jane, Peter stuff while it's still him. 
Sam Raimi hated that Spider-Man 3 was announced while they were making Spider-Man 2. Yeah. And he hated that essentially there was a target on the calendar. It's he the had parachute thing. Yeah. yeah. Right. It's like May 4th, 20, 2007. This thing's got to come out. Now, what is just absurd about that to consider is that Spider-Man 2 comes out like 24 months after Spider-Man 1. Like sure. it was a much tighter turnaround right. and that movie's right. immaculate. But I do think that gave them the wrong idea where they were like, we'll figure it out. Yeah. And so he and sits he was like, I don't know if we have it yet. They were like, don't fucking worry about it. He sits down with Ivan and he's like, let's break this story. So he's very interested in solving the, you know, resolving the Harry Osborne thing. Very interested in continuing Peter and Mary's romance, obviously. But they are kind of like, so, so obviously their fundamental thing is like, he's going to lose his way. He'll mm -hmm. come back. Like that's what three will be, right? Like right. it's gonna he he falls astray, he go, you know, right, and he comes on back. He has to learn that villains are not so simple, that he is not so heroic, right? That's what the Sandman arc well, will be. Two has ended with him and Mary Jane finally getting together and Harry finding out the truth about Spider Man. Two things that I remember in the theater watching two felt like they might drag this out for five movies. Which they could. I mean, they you, could, you could easily you could easily imagine a Spider Man three that actually drops the Harry stuff entirely. Yes, and just like leaves it for a fourth movie. Absolutely, Harry's in the background. Right, he's just sort of like become he's goblin and becoming goblin. I just remember being astonished that they fully just said, "Here's the status now." Going into the third one, yeah. Do you guys agree with like their whole point? Like, like the whole his all his quotes are basically like, "The most important thing for Peter to learn is the concept of him as an Avenger, as a hero." You know, paying, uh, you know, bringing criminals to justice, paying mm. down the debt of guilt about the de the death of Uncle Ben. We felt to be a great thing for him to be a little less black and white, to learn he's not above these people. He's not just the hero, and they're not just the villains. But it, but it's the thing that we were talking about of like what makes Peter Parker Spider Man. It's not the suit. It's not the bite. It's the fundamental guy here. What does he need to learn about himself? We're all sinners. None of us are right and wrong. Can right. I say something? Yeah. Yes. I don't think the Sandman shot your uncle dead. And he's he's his killer, but you know he had, he had a daughter to feed. Is a really really profound way of illustrating that. I think that's a little silly. I agree. I think the thing with Uncle Ben is stupid. He shot his fucking uncle. Like this is a this is a bad idea. This is a bad like it, it this is can be it a is, character with a lot yeah. of pathos without introducing this weird. He's tied to the original. Sandman crime. is my favorite part of the film, and I also think that is the single worst decision in the entire movie to make him Uncle Ben's killer. Right. See, I think. I think. It, I, I think it can work. It, sure. I think it can work because the the problem for Peter then becomes he has established himself as this hero who helps people, and here he's presented with an opportunity for revenge. And so, sort of the, the temptation of revenge is the thing that Peter has to overcome. And I think it's entirely, I, I think, it, I think it as a shortcut, it, it is a shortcut, but I think it works to just have him be involved in Uncle Ben's killing because it, it does become justifiable. That's what makes it difficult, right? Sure. So it becomes yeah, yes. justifiable for Peter to want to sort of like murk this guy. I, I am all in on the revenge <laughs> aspect of it. And I think that being the right thing to test this character with at this point in the series. My problem comes from it sort of invalidates the importance of the right. sequence in the first movie when he does like the shooter isn't some uh, guy cast in shadow who we don't really see. There's like 10 minutes of him interacting with this right. guy, letting That's him fair. get away, yeah. the eye contact, chasing him down, having that moment where he fucking dark man's out on him, like all that shit that I think the moment you go, th th he wasn't really the guy, he was an accomplice, it was this guy, and you wedge another guy in there. That doesn't work for me. It's like the thing of like, if they could have brought Michael Papa John back and gone like, and then he turns into the Sandman, that's one thing. To add a guy who fundamentally was not in the first movie, it rings weird for me, especially when the thing you're doing is like, the guy that Peter had the interaction with did everything up until the point where he essentially passed a gun to Thomas Hayden <laughs> Church, and then Thomas Hayden Church did the one thing. Right, right. Um... It's also, he's taking this character, Sandman, from Marvel, from Spider-Man's Rogues Gallery, mm -hmm. the classic Dicko Rogues Gallery, who has no backstory. Correct. The Sandman's backstory is he's a dude who turns into sand. That's right. it. Right. Like, who's like, hey, Spider-Man, eat some sand. Like, that's all he, he doesn't have any no. motivation. No, whatever. no. So you're sort of layering this onto this to make a sort of classic, like, you know, Jamel was saying, kind of old sort of Hollywood crime story yes. guy where it's like you know uh he, you know he has a heart he didn't mean it like and you know um 
And Thomas Hayden Church is good casting for really that. Cast. I mean, he looks like a he fucking looks dicko right. drawing. There's so many things. He does. His, his yeah. face. Yeah. Like, yeah. really yeah. looks. And just like yeah. how they bulked him yeah. up. So, right, right, yeah, right. yeah, he looks kind of top heavy. He's huge. Yeah, he yeah. says he oh. worked out for like 16 months. Yeah. Like, which is funny. Because he's like, kind of flabby and sideways. Well, because he was right. Yes. He was over the hill. I right. mean, he was very much. Yeah. Uh, anyway. I, I think he's great in this. I think he understands exactly what movie he's in. He's got such a great fucking voice for this. He does have that thing where when you look at like Herbie, Ditko, Ramita drawings in the 60s, you're like, do these guys know what skulls look like? <laughs> and then you look at Thomas Hayden Church and you're like, he's there got a 60s right. comic skull. Yeah, yeah. Right. Big, big, big brow, yeah. big eyebrows. The creases yeah. in his lips and the sides of his mouth and but his ears just now. this funny thing where he had just had the pinnacle of his career three years ago in Sideways. Right. Gets an Oscar nomination and a zillion awards. Like this stat I always love to throw out about Thomas Hayden Church's career is that he is, of course, the villain in George of the Jungle. Yeah. And then he is the only actor who returns for George of the Jungle 2, the direct-to-video movie, Whoa. which comes out the same year as Sideways. Right. Yes, like, that's right. where he's at. Is like, what am I going to do? Not be in yeah, fucking George of the Jungle 2? Yeah, he's uh, yeah George Showerman. It's an absolute, George. like, yeah. Hail Mary Pass revival casting. Right. This is essentially his first role after Sideways. Yeah. Like, he has two. You know, he's in Spanglish, which he made before Sideways, right. probably. Uh, he has two voice roles, and he is a brief cameo in Idiocracy. Yeah, but, but this that's is, it. This is the thing he signs up for after the he Oscar. Clearly, nomination. put so much work into yeah. it, and it's like this comes out, and people are like, "All right, buddy, see you later." Yeah, that's enough. Like enough of you. Like it he sucked. never got to have no. his nice little character actor post Oscar career. No, he's like done some good work since he's then. In but stuff, it, it and of course, I'm sure he made some money for No Way Home. He's in that for yeah. a second. Yeah, it doesn't feel like. Well, by the way, the footage in No Way Home. Is it literally night? He didn't even record it. Like when it's Peter just... Parker spouts him with the water and he starts melting yeah. and turning into mud, they reverse that footage so his hand is reforming. Right, right. right. And that's what it is. It's he, anyway. They did not shoot a single day with him. His voice acting is really good. Isn't it? Yeah, he's totally. He's totally. He's good. got an incredible voice. It is a shame, though, where you're like, I feel like we were deprived of both the good character actor run after this and also he didn't get enough shots to do fun big budget work yeah. like this yeah. as well. Can like, just, We Bought a Zoo is like, why is this the... It's weird. Yeah. Can I just say something about Sandman? Anything. He fucking rules. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, <laughs> Sandman... Very appropriate. Yeah. Sandman is my guy. Yeah. Yeah. Like, my dry guy. Yeah. Well, 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 one, obviously, he's a dry Sandman, sure. Yeah. But I feel like you also just like that he's like an old school hoodlum. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes. Like, yes. Yeah. But this movie unlocks something for me that, because I didn't really fuck with his character in the comics. I just yeah. remember him from the video game sure. I had. Mm -hmm. like, he always has the classic stripey shirt. That's his thing. He's got the stripey shirt. Right. Because right. like Spider-Man 1, they really make him rethink the goblin costume, right? right, right Spider-Man right. 2, he's just like, we're just going to put him in street clothes. He's just got the, the jacket he steals on the day. We're not even going to try to emulate the costume. This is like the most direct adaptation of how a character looked in the comics to screen, arguably ever. It's like, what does Sandman wear? Two-tone green striped shirt. Brown slacks, thick ass belt. Yeah. Done. Belt. Right. His whole fucking thing. He's a goon. He's a goon. He's a big old goon. But the way that they portray him traveling in the wind. That's right. I was cool. like, wait a second. Sandman is like actually this really incredible fucking character. Well, and he and also, got me really excited. Raimi, it's such a good match for Raimi because there's so many visual ideas you can come up yes. with for yeah. Sandman. Yeah. He's a guy whose power is so like. And yeah. every time you see him in a scene, it gets dusty as hell. You know, he leaves dust in his wake and just I my love favorite that. Sandman scene in the movie is when the cops are chasing him and he goes into the dump truck and the cop is like, Where does the sand come from? He, there is a lot of sand in that dump truck. Um so, Raimi says, we chose a villain that didn't have a detailed backstory so I could do this. Mm -hmm. He admits it. And, yeah. he, and he says, like, look, we changed the web shooters. Yeah. And I got away with that. Yeah. I think he, had, you know, he's a little bit like, I love the visuals of Sandman, but yeah. I figured there had to be more. Peter Parker sees himself as a proud person in a very narrow way. He's right and they're wrong. It's about taking on other points of view. He keeps hitting that. You know, yeah. he keeps hitting this like weird sort of like we have to teach Peter Parker to expand his moral worldview kind of. Like. I, I do think for a guy who's succeeding this hard in this franchise at this point in time, too, he sort of likes the challenge of like, we don't know if we can pull this off effects wise. Uh, this yeah. is a very different type of challenge. Let's yeah. see if we can do it. I yeah. mean, it's cool. I think they do. Right. Yeah. I mean, I don't think yeah. I really have any complaints about the visuals of Sandman. He's cool. Right. 
Yeah, he's fucking cool. I, I mean, but you get to things like, how does he turn into Sandman? He's running away from cops and he falls into a well, pit. He's that, escaped from prison, of course. I understand. Right? Yeah. He's, he's escaping from prison. He uh, runs. He falls into a pit. The pit happens to be the... Sand experiment. It's a super collider or whatever. Yes. Right. I do watch this movie and go, it would have taken five more minutes, but this is like, the movie doesn't have time, right? The idea of this movie being two hours and 17 minutes at this point is like, this is so overstuffed. This is right. so over... What are you supposed to do? Let this movie be three hours? Who would see a three-hour <laughs> Spider-Man movie, right? Do you really need to justify radioactive sand? Who gives a shit? No, this is all it's I'm saying. Spider-Man, This is right? all I'm saying. This is like the hurry this movie's in where I feel like they don't have the time to sort of unpack stuff in the way I feel like Spider-Man 2 in particular really gracefully builds shit up. Do you, does the character not become more tragic if the whole thing is he's like, I will agree to be a fucking scientific experiment to get out of jail, to have my sentence shortened or whatever? Mm. Sure. Right? That it's part of the thing of him wanting to get and see his daughter make money. He thinks it's going to kill him or whatever, and he'll have money to send to his wife and daughter. That's right. the original backstory. There is no, no, original no, no. The original oh, backstory is that you're he, inventing that. That's okay, like, I wasn't. That's, the original, that's a much better solution. That is. This, actually, right? yeah. Griff, that the is. original backstory, I believe, literally is he fell into a fucking right. sand experiment. No, but I'm just like, if, if you've set up this whole thing of he's doing it for his wife and daughter, he's a guy who's riddled with guilt, the mistakes he made, he wishes he could provide for them. They don't believe yeah, in no, him. Yeah, no, I get you. Yeah. And yeah. we're going to have to accept that there's some fucking technology that turns people into sand. Yeah. Yeah. Just the coincidence oh, of wait. this wow. is where the testing site is. <laughs> They're doing it at three o'clock in the morning. <laughs> he happens to run by and fall <laughs> into it like an open manhole <laughs> cover. It's, it's as... <laughs> I also just like, turn it on. Did you check one, one last time to see if there's anyone in it? Come yeah. on, just turn yeah, it on. Yeah, come on. Who cares? <laughs> Go get a bird or something. Yeah, Let's turn this sand up. But in the same movie, we're like, how does the symbiote attack? It fucking, yeah. Yeah, Comet like, hits and latches onto his bicycle. Like, it's just, everything's a little too... David? Yes? If you know one thing about me... Okay. Just try to guess. What's the, what's the number one thing you know about me? I'm, I'm asking you. It's a friend test. We've known each other for a long time now. We've been doing this podcast for a long time. I want to see. If you know one thing about me, what comes, what rises to the brain first? You you always dread taking the time and effort to fertilize your lawn. Incorrect. David, I used to dread taking <gasps> the time and effort to fertilize my lawn. It was my most infamous quality right, that I, of course. I would I that. dread it. But that's changed. David, I'm a different man. Now I look forward to it. Oh, why is that? You know why? Because Sunday's lawn care products are quick and easy. I don't even have to go to the store. Everything is delivered right to my door. It has so fundamentally changed every aspect of my life. Yeah, everyone wants a beautiful lawn without all those harsh chemicals. No one more than me. So you're using Sunday. You're using this, this uh, product that has ingredients you can actually pronounce, like seaweed, iron. Molasses. Molasses. I mispronounce every word, and I, I said those three words correctly. So weed, Iran, and molasses. The best part, David? Yes. It works. Oh, that is good. That that it would really would not be any good if it didn't it would, work. It would suck if after all this wind up I revealed that in fact it did not work. Are there any questions you want to ask me, David? Uh hmm, let's see. I mean, does your lawn have weeds or bare patches or pet spots? I'm gonna give you an answer. Can I give you an answer real straight? Yeah. I'm just gonna throw a smoker right by you, okay? Answer is not anymore. Oh, because, because Sunday, Sunday they helped yeah. me solve all these problems and more the easy way. They got everything that I need from fertilizer to seeds to weed control and it's delivered right to my door. That door that's surrounded by a very well maintained lawn. That's really cool. I love it. Thank you. And you know, your yard is your personal oasis, it deserves the best. So you want to grow a beautiful lawn, uh, control pests and fight weeds without the toxic stuff. Yeah. The lawn care, it's effective and super easy, I've been told. You just go to sunday.com, you put in your address, and their lawn analysis tool does the rest. They're going to use soil and climate data and create a personal nutrient plan for you. Oh, delivered right, right to my door. And it's, it, you know what I love about things being delivered right to my door? Uh, no, you're going to have to tell me. That's where the lawn is. Of course. Every time I go to my front door to pick up a package, I'm reminded of my beautiful Manhattan lawn. Uh, you, you're a Manhattan lawn boy and we love it. Uh, look, I'm going to call to action. Please, I insist. Sunday is offering our listeners 20% off. Full season plans start at just $129 and you can get 
20% off when you visit GetSunday.com slash check at checkout. That's 20% off your custom plan at GetSunday.com slash check. The original plan was to, to have Vulture appear at the end of this movie. Right. Uh, to set up Spider-Man 4. Right. They wanted Ben Kingsley. John Malkovich was considered. There's a lot of names like yep. that. Uh, as Thomas Hayden Church puts it, all that got derailed. And then he corrects. He's like, well, not so much derailed, but took a different railway, which I actually think is a good way of putting it. I where it's you. like Sam Raimi had his idea. And then suddenly like Avi Arad is like pulling a switch and the train is like going express. I, I anyway. believe Kingsley was like in negotiations. They definitely talked to him about it. Yeah. yeah and yeah, for yeah, Spider-Man yeah. 4, they straight up hire Malkovich. They they did hire Malkovich for a movie that never. It was existed. a done deal, right? Yeah, yeah. It's, um, it's interesting just sort of thinking about you know the wanting to stuff multiple villains into this movie. Um, in this, you know, the train was derailed. It does feel like Sony basically has spent the last fifteen years really trying to make a movie with all the Spider Man villains. Yes, they're like obsessed they just with the Sinister they're, Six. They're, movie, they're right. absolutely obsessed with it and having them coexist on screen, yeah. which makes no sense because the Sinister Six are not independently a comic book entity. It's not like I pick up a Sinister Six comic. No. They fight Spider-Man. Right. right. But like, I don't then like read about like their interactions. No. Like I don't get what a Sinister Six movie is. Who no. are the Sinister well, Six? This is thing. The Sinister Six. Dr. Octopus, Sandman, who we got? Electro, Rhino, Mysterio, Electro, Mysterio, Rhino, the Vulture. But, but, but the like, Vulture. And cool. then maybe, you know, eventually you can swap one it in. Rotate. You know, Craven's in there sometimes. Yeah. Like, it's, it's, it's basically all of Spider-Man's villains are sort of like they Every so often, they're like, let's get together and try to really, like, fuck this guy up. Like, hang. Yeah, let's. But mostly fuck him up. So right. it's, there, there actually, there was a. It's like Ringo Starr and his all-star band, where it's like, who's available this <laughs> right, week? It's the traveling Wilburys. Right. Okay, like, there's a lot of comparison. The around, idea is just, let's get six of us. Around the same time and as we're the um, Superior Spider-Man reboot, there was the, uh, was the Superior, it was the, 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 the something enemies of Spider-Man. It was a book that was all of his, like, B and C tier enemies. Yeah. Uh -huh. Who hung out together and kind of just griped about getting their asses kicked yeah, by that's superior right. foes like. of spider yes. And that was actually really good. Yeah. Right. That, that's that, like Beetle and Shocker yeah. and Speed Demon. Like the really lame That's kind of a, a premise right. for a movie. Right. right? That's right. that's the direction you would go Where, where you're being funny about. Right. The, the right. Drew Goddard yeah. Sinister Six movie always sounded like it was like... The, the thing he always said was that he was making like Sorcerer. Like it was a bunch of cons who all were stuck on a mission together. It sort of sounded like he was trying to make Suicide Squad. Yeah. Sure. And that, that it was a heisty suicide so squad. And it's amazing thing. that Marvel's never done a Thunderbolts movie, which would be their suicide squad. Like, they'll do yeah. it eventually. But it also yeah. feels like whatever the Julia Louis Dreyfus stuff is happening is either going to set up Dark Avengers or Thunderbolts or some version of that. It never ends. Anyway, okay. But, so, but I do think just because we watched Batman Forever yesterday, David, yeah. there is that thing that I think Sony is jealous of where they're just like, there was a point where Warner Brothers was able to put a bunch of these characters on the screen at the same time. And it even goes back to just Adam West series, how exciting it was if you saw an episode where two of them teamed up. And in, in the Spider Man episode, I talked about how, like, they made so much fucking merchandise of all the civilian characters because they were like, I don't know, it's Spider Man. Well, kids want to buy Norman Osborne and an Oxford shirt. For Spider Man 2, they were like, no, we have two characters. We only can make merchandise of two characters. It's Spider Man, it's Doc Ock. We don't even bother making anyone else. As much as like Batman Forever gets dinged with like that's the toyetic, that's the movie where the toy companies come in and start demanding stuff. The main producer on this film is Avi Arad, whose background is a toy company. And yeah. I think he's going to him and he's like, You have two characters per movie that are visually dynamic. You need to give me more. You need to give me fucking something to work with here. Yeah. And the idea of being able to like have a lineup of, you know, these characters coexisting on screen at the same time visually. I think was just like Sony was jealous that they weren't playing that game. Was Sandman the toy filled with sand? Should have been. There probably was um, at some point. Yeah. Look, yeah, probably. I, Sandman is in Sam Raimi's story. Laura Ziskin swings in mm -hmm. and says, "Gwen Stacy should be in the movie." Great. Sam Raimi's like, "That makes no sense. Why would she be in the movie?" We skipped Gwen. We skipped Gwen. Right? She's actually Peter's high school girlfriend. Mary Jane comes later. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't think Gwen is not a compelling character in her own right, which she's not. She's a yep. terrible character in the comics. She's sure. just like, oh, Peter, why won't you pay attention to me? Like, yeah, she, she you know. more or less exists just to get killed by the Green Goblin. Right. They, they, right. The reason they kill her off, like, it's funny because, of course, you know, they talk about it. They're like, we can't believe we did that. It was such mm -hmm. a shocking loss of innocence for the comics. But also, she was a non-character. Yeah, right. right. Uh, Mary Jane she's immediately very had more by personality that. by the first frame. Well, I mean, the introduction of Mary Jane in comics is the greatest panel right. in comics history. It's so good. Yeah. Um, but uh, but yeah, so like Gwen is just not 
like, you know, there's nothing. It's not like we can't wait to have Gwen on screen so she can. Yeah, like there, there's no answer to that question. But Gwen I think doesn't that really must have, have been the thing. thing of like, have we resolved the love story? Do people like it's the the one more day thing of like, do people want to watch him just be happy with Mary Jane? There well, has to be trouble in paradise. That, right? But it's also I think it's it's what more what you're saying as well, where it's just like, no, there needs to be Gwen. She's right. a character from Spider-Man. Right. She hasn't been in these movies yet. Right. Put her in the movie. Right. So that they can have Gwen then. Like yes. Gwen will be available at yes. all times going right. forward. Like it's just like get these people in movies. Right. And Gwen gives us Captain State. Like just get fucking exactly. everyone in here. Now, so you read all this stuff about Raimi, to his credit, basically just complaining to Premier Magazine about this. Mm-hmm. But then uh, Raimi says, well, okay, so we decided to take this policeman character who's on the periphery of the scenes and turn him into Captain Stacy mm-hmm. and make this one character who's in the jazz bar, Gwen Stacy. Okay. The worst possible fix is like, why don't we just take this nothing character, flesh her out a little more, yeah. put her in five scenes versus one, yeah. and now Gwen Stacy's in the film. And it's like, well, now you just have this like distraction. Yes. Who doesn't get to do anything. Right. Anyway. I like her line when she's introing Spider-Man. She goes... Like, he's everyone's favorite. He saved me from 89 stories above. <laughs> like, what a weird, like, credit to, that, like, intro someone yes, with. Yes, yes. Okay. Um, it almost sounds like a joke, but I don't think it's actually a joke. And then Avi Arad, right. of course, is like, Sam, the fans demand Venom. They want Venom. I know. You were reading comics in the 60s and 70s. This was his whole fucking thing. You're like, stuck you in don't the get 60s. It. Right. Yeah. Kids these days love Venom. Ben Hosley loves Venom. <laughs> I love Venom. Ben Hosley is asking I, where Venom is. I've read I do Venom. not like Venom. You're what? anti are you I'm anti Venom Venom. Too. I'm not anti anti Venom. <laughs> <laughs> Another character. But in I don't like, like a serum or anything. Right. Right, right. Uh, but I've um, never liked Venom. Yeah, I don't like Venom either. I just think Venom. Smacks. Venom, who is a, a thing when we were all kids, right, right. the height of his Humanist. popularity in the comics, was right. just a drool. Was like the, and, and absolutely <laughs> fucking great, the, like the biggest new comic M- major adversary for Spider-Man for a, a, right. a decade, if not more. It yeah. just it's it's too much of the '90s. Got to be extreme. Big, that's be my whole thing. thing. Yeah, it's just it's right. too it's it's so Big teeth. Right. He the character Charged feels so head. dated, and it's not for nothing that like. Recent takes on Venom have basically been an attempt to sort of like walk that back, right? Yeah. Like Venom now is sort of like he's kind of an anti-hero. Sure. Right. He's sort of like you know he's not slobbering all over the place. It's like if, slobbers maybe, a little bit. Maybe he slobbers a little bit. But, but he's not. I'm, he's just. He's just. I don't know. I think I, that the I, Tom Hardy yeah. movies do try to encapsulate the chaotic energy of Venom. Yes. He goes to the club. Yeah, but that's what I like is that they're not trying to make him badass. Right, right, right. Exactly. Right. He's weird and silly. Yeah, I mean, to Venom, created by Todd McFarlane this and is what I was David Michelin or whoever. It's you know. not like it's a, a great American fiction, right? But I look at Venom and I look a lot of that McFarlane Spider-Man stuff and I'm like, this is dry run for Spawn. And Spawn, for what it is, is just... It, it works more successfully when you're just letting Todd fucking go off and give you his whole fucking worldview. Mm. And I feel like Venom just feels like Todd McFarlane trying to impose his shit onto a Spider-Man universe that isn't really a match for it. Well, yeah. The counter would be, and I was not a huge... I don't, like, just I let don't, him do Clown and Violator and just go all the way but, into that like, shit. I think what they would, did in the 80s is they were like, we, we're looking at the rogues gallery. The rogues gallery is notorious. It's all these Ditko guys. It's not like Spider-Man has bad villains. Right. He doesn't have like a mirror image villain, right? Yes. Like he doesn't have a like, who's the anti-Spider-Man right. or whatever. And so that's the idea, right? Right. And the idea of the suit is so good. And I yeah. love that plot line in Spider-Man. Yeah. Like him getting the alien suit. Right. And then eventually realizing, like, this thing's kind of malevolent. You know the whole Secret Wars thing, right? We can't get into that. We're not doing that. It's too much. Um, Can I give one sentence to Ben? They made a deal with Mattel, the toy company. and they were why like, he wants to talk about it, to be clear. It's a toy. Thing. I had a bunch of those toys. Yeah. Yes. They were like, superhero toys don't sell. We need to, like, build a comic series around, like, setting up a toy line. And so Mattel gave them like a focus group list of things that kids like. And they were like, the two most popular words are secret and war. <laughs> <laughs> kids, they love to keep secrets Truly. and they, they fucking sh- love war. Right. <laughs> they just want to. Kids are vicious, man. Right. And they were like, new costume. <laughs> How did they come to that? Aliens. That's insane. This okay, is the whole thing. I'm sorry. Right. So they were like, you have to do a series called Secret War in which these 20 characters go to a planet. Spider Man should team up with an alien. He should become an alien. And they were just like, okay, fine. 
I'm they essentially have this joke? huge comic book run written by What's toy the executives. Joke? The Simpsons joke, they're, they're, wow. they're the focus, it's like a focus group oh, joke. Yeah, like yeah. You, you want him to be uh, like, fuck, what, it's the focus group of, uh, you know, where they're trying to get Poochie done. Right, right, right. right, right. Uh, fucking. The, the, you want him to be down to earth and realistic. <laughs> right. But totally out of control. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. But, but there is that thing where like... It, the entire alien symbiote so, so you want thing. a realistic down to earth show that's completely off the wall and swarming with magic robots <laughs> <laughs> and the kids are like yeah, yeah. <laughs> but the like the miracle, I would watch that <laughs> yeah sure the miracle is that the symbiote stuff is well written it's kind of a cool that idea that it works and the design is good and all of that they execute it well but then when they get rid of the suit they're like sort of like well what should we do with this alien thing Right, and it's also, it's like, um, you know, it, it makes sense to turn it in, you know, he attaches to Eddie Brock. Eddie Brock doesn't right. like Peter Parker, you know, it doesn't right. like Spider-Man. Right, just the idea of, what if it went to the wrong guy? Right. And then, as you say, the top, because when you initially see Venom, he doesn't have the big pointy teeth or anything like that. The Todd McFarlane thing yeah. just kind of takes it over, where it's like, make him bigger, make More him slobberier, right. make him have the weird tongue. Right. I think it had to happen. This is something comics had to get out of their system yes. in the yeah. late 80s, early 90s. And then 90s. It, it spins off into image. Like, it, it is yeah, sort sure. of, right, it's... But Venom yeah. remains as this sort of like, but that guy is, he made it into the rogues gallery, right? right. Like, he is one of those few 80s Spider-Man villains. But I just... Like, Let's keep him around. I never found Eddie Brock very compelling. He's so big. Which is why I'm just like, when other people were like, why are they turning Eddie Brock into just like Weasley or Peter Parker? And I, I there was nothing sacrilegious about that to me. I was like, that sounds like a more interesting take on the character to just make it Peter Parker without morals well, let me than read, making yeah. him a bully. Let me read you a quote, in fact. Topher Grace, yeah. who plays Eddie Brock in this yeah. film, says, he's more of a doppelganger to Peter. Yeah, He's someone very similar, has the same powers, but had a bad upbringing. These parallels is what I like about the character. Um, he doesn't have an Uncle Ben. I would say to Sam on the set, with great power comes great fun. Mm. Topher Grace seems to be the biggest fan of this movie, of the people involved with it. Yeah. Who had the most fun making it. Yeah. And it's kind of like, I know people don't like it, but like, I really like what we were going for, at least. It also grinds his career to a halt more 100%. than anyone else. It's devastating to his career. Because this is the moment where everyone's like, is he Tom Hanks? Because he had we're just given him a run. Good Company, right? In Good, I feel like company, in good company was everyone, everyone was Tad like, Hamilton. Kind of yeah. Uh, yeah Tad was Hamilton. It was a PS. He had to run a thing where they were like, we're like. He's in Take Me Home Tonight, right? He well, is. So yeah. that is, he wrote that movie, or at least. Which like, is a movie I like a he lot. He wrote the story. Okay. Yeah. He it's when I think they've shot this movie before it comes out. Correct. He it goes was... to Revolution and he's, everyone's like, Topher Grace, you're about to be the next big star. What do you want to do? And he's like, I want to do my American Graffiti. There hasn't been an 80s generational coming of age movie. We're finally at enough distance. I want to do this. They shoot it. It's on shelf for like three years. Right. That famously took forever to It was supposed to released, be like, right? the, I think the immediate cash in from the success of Spider-Man. And when that didn't work and all of Dan Fogler's comedies didn't work and whatever, it's that thing where like it comes out and Anna Ferris and Chris Pratt have been married for three years and that's the movie where they meet. Yeah. But, but yes, that's like his follow up to this. And this movie ruined his It's, it's on shelf forever. Yeah. Because his follow yeah, after this, he's in Valentine's Day in 2010. Yeah. He's in Predators. Which is him being like, I'm playing against type. I play a serial killer. He's in Take Me Home Tonight, which is released very late. Uh, but that's, it's really, that's it. So Predators is the one where they're on the planet. Yes. Yes. Okay, yes. That, that's With actually Adrian Brody. pretty good. That's, it's, like it's a really fun movie. 10 yeah. different types of deadly human. Right. And everyone's like, what's this guy doing here? And it's like, oh, he's like. He's this. He's this kind of bad right. thing. Right. Yeah. I mean, when he was in, when Topher popped up in Interstellar, it was truly a like, is that Topher great? Like, yeah. it was really a, like, Ew, I haven't seen him in years. Like, he just like quietly has a hit ABC show now. Does it? Home Economics, season two. I believe it's been picked up for season three. You made this up. I this did not. Is not true. Home Economics. I'm reading it, but you just put so a Wikipedia article. Uh, what's his name? J Jimmy Tatro. I, I'm seeing what you wrote down on Wikipedia, but this is not real. <laughs> Picked up for season three. Right? Uh, it certainly has Jesse done season two, two seasons. Uh, I'm not sure about season three yet, but I'm hoping okay. against hope that he'll probably get another bite at the apple then. Yeah. I mean, he seems like kind of an eternal. How old do you think he is? I think he's like 40 something. He has to be like 45, right? He's 43. To me, that's younger than I thought. Huh. Just yeah. because 
that '70s show to me, I'm like, yeah. I was like a teenager. When well, that also, was on. like, yeah, Kirsten Dunst just turned forty this week. Right, yeah. they were. She was really young in the first Spider-Man. Right, she's right. one of those yeah. people where you're like, for how long she's been famous, it's impossible that she was still in her thirties until seven days ago. What do you guys think of Topher Grace's performance in this film? Uh, if we're talking Venom. Yeah, we might so, as well. So here's what I'll say. I remember defending this performance when it came out. Yeah. Uh, I felt like he largely does what is asked of him. Well, I think the only scene that doesn't work is the church scene, which I don't even put on him. It, do- it definitely doesn't work. It definitely well. doesn't sure. work. And I yeah. think his performance is kind of embarrassing there, but I think that's a failing of what they're asking to do. Yeah. It's, it's an, I think that is an impossible scene to play. You mean where they basically just have to rush the Venom origin yeah. so quickly. Right. Yeah. And it's just like, it It does not make sense in any way. Uh, Patricia Kalember, who played my mother on The Tick, uh, who was also in Signs, she plays uh, Mel Gibson's uh, crushed wife. Yeah. Uh, great actor. There was a scene I had with her that was like a big emotional scene. And I was really struggling. And it was that thing of like, I was like pushing. The thing that I feel like in a lot of the like tearful emotional scenes in this movie, you feel in the performances where it's just like they're sort of trying to make sad faces yeah. and crying voices, but it doesn't really feel like they're actually upset. And she said this thing to me I always think about where she said, I find like if I'm in a scene like this and I'm pushing for the emotion and I can feel myself struggling, it's because I'm not getting specific enough. You have to think of like what the specific thing is rather than just the general idea of being sad. And I think this movie has a lot of scenes where the direction is be sad. And it's like the You're movie upset. The movie has not spent the time building up the emotions to that point where it's like there's one scene where he gets vaguely embarrassed. And the next scene, we're supposed to believe he's like having an emotional breakdown, crying on his knees, saying, God, please kill Peter Parker. <laughs> Which I got to say is very funny. <laughs> Incredibly funny. <laughs> it's very funny to go to church and be like, I know I don't Lord, come here often yeah. enough. <laughs> Lord, Lord, my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. All I ask for you. One thing. All I ask usually in your go, eternal goodness right, right. is to kill that motherfucker. Right. <laughs> it's so funny because, right, usually it would be like, look, I know I'm not a church going guy. Right. I know I haven't talked to you in a long time, but. My wife is sick, but it's like, <laughs> this guy is really grinding my gears. He embarrassed me like two hours. Because <laughs> right. I even. He, I, he totally fucked me over by revealing that right. I did something bad. My point is, I, I think, think he deserves to die, don't you? I think he's really bad in that scene, but I also think <laughs> there is no way no, to make that scene, scene specific. But okay, but that so scene doesn't make any sense. Why feel but about. In, 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 so go in, ahead, in, in defense of the performance. Yeah. I think everything before that is good. I agree. And he's I, good I, when he's a slick little. Yeah, jerk. I like yeah. his venom. Like I like his shitty. Okay, all right. That was my question. Like so, like, I when, do. I defend when the it. mask is up and he's got the sort of like the tendrils and the weird teeth. I just wish the mask stayed down more, but I still like his performance. They do take the masks off a lot, and I wonder if they're just kind of like, well, these are the stars. We need to see their faces. When you rewatch the first one. Yeah. He, they both take off their masks so infrequently, and right. there is that problem where he, like, and Raimi has talked about where, when we Green got Goblin on set. Especially, there's yeah. nothing relate to if you, both of them have masks on, and I would have to force them to gesticulate more, and it felt silly. So the second one, it's like Doc Ock's face visible the entire time. And Peter Parker's mask constantly. comes off a lot more. It's coming and, off all the time. And this blows is, off. In the this is the one where it's like he won't stop taking his mask off. Yeah. Venom's face retracts. Goblin's mask retracts. Right. Salmon's thing, whatever. I even like. Topher's vocal performance when he's Venom. I like Venom just being some little shit. Like, I don't yeah. need him to be tough or scary. I like him being a pain in the ass. Do you like how his eyebrows kind of, like, cocked? Eternally the cocked? Weird, yeah, I mean, that's like, like mm. genuine prosthetic makeup where yeah. he was just, like, his face was being grabbed all day. I just think they play that too much considering he's only on screen for eight minutes and for seven of those he eight minutes. He looks like this. Yeah. That's what he looks like. They should keep the face down. <laughs> you know what's not helping him at all is those frosty, frosty tips. Well, that's true. It's Woo. very, very right of the moment, oh, his, his blonde so hair. So bad. Yeah. But if we can go back to the church scene Spiky for a second. blonde hair. Sure. Like, much like saying, like, why isn't Flint Marco donating his body to science to get money for his wife and daughter, right? That scene even makes more sense of if the energy of it is him walking in being like, I want Peter Parker dead. Not the I am crushed. Right, right, I am yeah. humbled. Yeah, why is he right. on my knees? Like that's why that scene is impossible to play, and it's also based on once again the coincidence of Peter Parker decides at that very moment he has to take the suit off in the spire of a church. I just think that once we'd seen Tom Hardy have this take where he's like, the guy's kind of burly, but he's also just inherently bizarre. Yeah, before Venom touches him, right? He's just one of those guys where like you want to sit him down and be like. 
What's going on with you? <laughs> What's your deal? <laughs> what is this you don't want to be do? cornered by Tom Hardy's Eddie Brock at a party. No. <laughs> and then once Venom joins him, because well, he's a, a brutally tough journalist. Right. Yeah, of course, he'll, ask the, yes, talk, he'll yes. ask the hard questions for the Eddie Brock yeah. show. Yeah. Hey, but like, uh, I got a question for you. Uh, why are you corrupt? <laughs> what's going on? <laughs> what, what's in your lab? I like that his whole bit is that he's like this like fucking vice <laughs> young Turks Ed, journalist Eddie, that everyone's like integrity. Hey, hey, you, know, hey, the, the, you seem like a bad guy. <laughs> What's up? Because like the premise of that movie is that why are you so bad? Is it Ron Cephas <laughs> Jones plays his boss? He's like Eddie, just do me a favor. Yeah, go interview Lord Evil. Right. You know, at Evil Corp. I, don't ask him don't any ask tough, the questions. tough questions. <laughs> this is a simple job. Yeah. Yeah. Just go ask yeah. him. And he's like, yeah, yeah one question. Uh, everyone who takes your chemicals seems to die. Any, any yeah. comments? <laughs> yeah, Vladimir Putin. I got one question for you. You ever think about being good? <laughs> what's the matter with you? Anyway, and then like the idea. Like what's, Eddie what's, is what's, just Danny Zuko now. What's the, what's, 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 hey, what's Sandy, the, I got a question for you. Hitler, Why are you smoking deal? cigarettes now? What's the deal? Paul Pot, what's your problem? <laughs> Yo, Hitler, then, take it easy, man. Once, once <laughs> the suit merges with him, right? The best <laughs> gag in Venom is yeah. the suit saying like, you're kind of a loser. Me too. Where I come from, I was also kind of a loser. Right, we kind of suck. <laughs> right. <laughs> like, like, this right. is all we got going for right. us. Right. Whereas this is more like Hofer Grace wants God to kill Spider-Man. Yeah. And instead, Goop lands on him and he's like, I'm going to be Venom. And then he tries to kill Spider-Man. I think Does he when, do anything else? No. I think when Venom takes over, what he, happens? He could have some fun, right? Like, you know, if you're going by Topher, why don't we see Venom do a thing. Here's, right. here's the arc. To, to be sort of like a, go a rob shitty a bank. spider. Man. Yeah, yeah. Right. Go here's do the some arc of thing. Venom as a character. Okay, Venom specifically. Church, please, God, kill Peter Park. <laughs> screams at screen, right? It, symbiote takes over him, screams at screen. Next scene is he's crawling on a wall, Flint Marco in an alleyway. Hey, you're a bad guy, right? I'm a bad guy too. Let's kill Spider Man together. The scene that you were like saying happens yeah, in every right. one of those classic Batman movies where they have to at some point go, the Our interests like, are Two Face. You're very Two Facey, and I'm a Riddler, so <laughs> right. I'm sensing a lot right. of mixing here, right? right? Yeah. That scene happens one hour and 45 minutes into the movie. Right. And the next time you see Venom, Mary Jane is in a car in a web at the top of scaffolding and he's just jumping around. He That's sure the is. entire arc of Venom. And then there's just that final fight sequence. His face stays down for a total of three minutes maximum. Yeah. Web yeah. is cool. It's black web. I I like the way Venom it makes like a real spider web. You, know? you like that it's not, it's basically just Spider-Man with some teeth. It's not yeah, really too I different. Yeah, but I think, and right. look, you can see their alternate designs, not even just like designs, but like makeup costume tests they did where they pushed even further the idea of it like, looking like an evil Spider-Man suit, making the webs more jagged. Like, they're cooler alternate versions of it. There's one where they did his face totally prosthetic that is terrifying. Mm. The actual Venom alien face, like, done in prosthetics, it's fucking creepy as shit. Um, But I, yeah, I I like this. I prefer making Venom a true mirror, as we said. Like, that's sort of what he started out as. And then he got heightened to this, like, spawn dry run thing. And I like bringing him back down to there. I just, I think, it's, it's so rushed at the end, and uh, I I think Topher Grace could have worked in this. I think he is fun in parts, and I I just think everyone wanted Venom so fucking badly. They were like largely hiding him from the marketing. You were only getting glimpses. It truly was a thing where people were like, I can't wait to see fucking Venom in his full glory. And then when every five seconds his face peels up and it's Topher Grace being like, Hey, how do you like them apples? I think people were just irate. How did you feel, Jamel? Do you remember how you seeing this film at the time? Do you I did. I saw this opening weekend. Um, I was at UVA, so I was in Charlottesville, and with my buddy, a buddy of mine, um, we went to go see it. And he, I remember coming out of it, he was like, "That sucked." And I was like, "I kind of liked it." Um, and this has been my my view. Right. You've always had this, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. right. Yeah. Um, but I, 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 at the time, I just, I don't, I think it's very clear watching the film that the Venom stuff is just sort of extraneous. And that, like, it is, like, the, the one film. part of the thing that is really kind of, like, this doesn't this doesn't really fit the vibe or the tone or really anything of what the movie is trying to do. Having said that, I think, we, and you said this earlier, David, the, the Venom stuff also is occasion for some of the moments of the movie that I really like. The best so, parts of the movie. So we, we haven't Crazy. talked about it, but sort of, like, yeah. the dance sequence. Yes. The, the, the whole, the, the James Brown sort of, like, you know, walk montage thing and the dance sequence in the jazz club are great. And when I was watching it last night, 
my 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 wife who is a normal person and doesn't brag. like watch <laughs> not the wife at the normal person but also person. who doesn't like go on Twitter and have arguments about Spider-Man right, 3 like right, we right. all do right she, yeah, yeah, she yeah, had yeah. never seen this before and i was like you know people people, people mocked hated this, this. was yeah. like the the height of derision right but when you watch it you're like no this is great it's so good not only that Sam Raimi is in complete control yeah you're like this thing is completely hitting the bullseye of exactly the tone right it is trying to do. I, I remember Dave Poland, notorious movie <laughs> when blogger. When he does this, and the camera zooms into him, it's so good. Or, or, yeah. or you know, when he shows the, entire the time, jacket and the camera goes like, <laughs> yes. The entire time, there are two women who are always sort of like kind of in the frame. And yeah. They're always sort of like looking back at him like, who? what the hell is happening <laughs> with this guy? <laughs> like, I love it. It's just, I remember also feeling my entire audience go like, yes. what the fuck? And then you think that this is a year before Iron Man and the Dark I know, Knight. I know. It's that, that, that's, the, their universe is apart. I know. That's kind of crazy. It, it's, I mean, I, it is, I don't want to distract absolute, too much from the movie, but like, yes. it is crazy to think that the next year, yeah. this is like the end of an era it's for the a end kind of this kind of, of a like, movie. Yeah, these sort yeah. of very earnest, yeah. poppy, we, we've, we've 60s gotten, inspired, yeah. We've gotten past the 90s sort of embarrassed that these mm. are genre superhero movies. Right. These things are powerhouses now. Right. Yeah. Sort of like now it's, it's earnest. It's sort of like trying to be really faithful. And we're just about to get over to this new phase of them being kind of like yes. totally culturally dominant. These are the two ways you can do this movie now. You can do Iron Man or you can do Dark Knight. And right. Those are the only two options. Those, right? those are the options. And like the dance sequence becomes sort of like a tabla rasa of like, we have to make sure this never happens again. It, yeah. it becomes like Batman and Robin level. Yes. Oh God, that was embarrassing. But it, right. it is yeah, the yeah. Batman and Robin's kind of good. Well, agree. that's sure. Agree. I mean, we, we, we're, we're in the middle of that <laughs> yeah. on our Patreon, absolutely. It is like the strongest take Sam Raimi has in this movie from a story perspective is this idea of like, Peter Parker is inherently a dork. What yeah. defines him is that he is a dork with good morals. Sure. There is no evil version of Peter Parker. There's a selfish there's version a dork of Peter with Parker. Morals. Sure. Right. Right. There's yes. there's sort yes. of like a quasi incel version of right. Peter Parker. Right. 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 Yeah. And I think people were like, because even the marketing campaign for this movie, even aside from that poster, there was the poster that was him with the bags under the eyes and the hair and the idea of like, oh fuck, Peter Parker's gonna go bad. Sure. And I think everyone assumed he was going to be badass and tough. They had successfully hidden all of the comedy in the trailers. So when that happens, people are like, why is this movie not yeah. giving me him being a vigilante, Venom being an asshole and a bully? But those sequences are so fun. Um, Dave Poland, notorious movie blogger, yeah, industry blogger. Blog. I remember at the time, the cold blog, uh, at the time when that movie came out, said like, Jesus Christ, does Sam Raimi clearly want to make a musical? It is insane right. that he has shoehorned three full musical numbers into this film and you watch it and it is incredible Well, because there's the 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 early broadway show number Correct. which I, I think is actually kind of great agreed uh, and like kind of calms the movie down after yeah. the opening or whatever and then there's the, the dancing jazz club sequence and, and then the it jazz ends club. with right. this sad musical number at the club it does yeah. and you even have the twist sequence with harry and mary is and, almost a musical number in and of itself and i want to say all of that to me really works and yes. i wish the whole movie could be on that level now i do think that would have been poorly received absolutely right by audiences at the time but yes. i at least like i i want that tonal consistency throughout like well, i want it to feel like that it's throughout. the character stuff that works yes. right yes. sort right. of like that's that's um you guys have already spoken about spider-man 2 but that's in mean, spider-man 2 is great because not there's not a frame of that movie is disconnected from the characters from right. peter Correct. mary jane absolutely. and harry the yeah. entire yeah. movie that movie is slow, and again, we did talk about this, but like, that movie takes its time in the first it is hour. It's so patiently paced. And it's then, like, incredible. the last hour is really lots is yeah. happening, and the action is so incredible. But, like, yeah, it's like, you know, it's, it's careful. It's got it tonality. has a whole scene of just like uh, uh, Doc Ock, his wife, and Peter having, lo having I mean, lunch. I mean, that scene is it's, phenomenal. It's maybe the best scene in the movie. Yeah. It's so, I mean, it's, vis and beyond, and it's not the best scene in the movie because that movie has such amazing scenes, but. It's so crucial to the end yes. of the movie. Working. Right, right, right. Which, and which this movie tries. This is God this is another the, reason I will ahead. always defend this movie, is that even though it can't get the execution right because it has too many things on its mind, this movie still attempts to have those scenes. Yes. they're clumsier. Right, they but don't, it still they attempts usually to have feel more them. rushed. Is the right. problem? Right, they feel right, rushed. Right, they right. feel sort of like they're written with sort of like clear. Obvious signposts of emotional beats that are telegraphed too directly rather than earned. But I still just watching this now 15 years later when so many of these movies are so caught up in every scene is lore building, mythos building, teeing up other shit. 
Peter going to his Aunt May and talking about wanting to marry Mary Jane and, and Rosemary Harris giving a pretty good monologue yeah, about what it nice takes scene. to be a good husband. The Teresa Russell scene where she's just like, you fuck everything up in your life. Yeah, that seems... That, again, I wish I was... None of them but like what you're work s- as well as one and two, but they're no. there. Yeah. But the thing, and the thing is now with these MC movies, which I enjoy and watch, but it's like with those movies, you can look at your watch and be like, it's been 15 minutes. We're about to have a set piece, yeah, right? Yeah. Like those movies just kind of have that where's internal quip, clock. Where's a set piece? Right. Exactly. Yeah. Where it's just like, don't, don't worry, don't worry. Yeah, yeah. We had to have two scenes where everyone sat yeah. down and explained what's going on, but then like, don't worry, Schumer Garath is gonna, you know, show up. Like something's right. gonna happen. Right. Raimi isn't quite. I feel like as slavish to that, like or whatever. No, you know, I, like, I mean, here's a, an interesting thing I clocked watching this film. Uh, you know, we talked about David Kep when he was pitching Spider-Man. His two things were he can't end up with the girl at the end and I want to take a long time until we introduce Spider-Man. We really have to earn it. We have to like treat this like Don or Superman where we build to that, right? So the opening credit sequence in the first Spider-Man, which is so good, is Raimi sort of trying to appease the audience by being like, we're going to give you the hero theme right off the top. We're going to give you CGI imagery of Spider-Man so you remember while you're here and then buckle in because it's going to be 45 minutes until he puts the suit on. Spider-Man 2, he puts the suit on like minute three to deliver sure. pizzas. He's, he's Spider-Man. He's Spider-Man. This movie starts with Peter Parker. And, and also, the opening credits sequence was another moment of slight deflation where you're like, opening credits in first one, cool. Opening credits in second one, replaying they, they, the greatest moments, Alex Ross. Alex Ross. Incredible. Right. And this opening one's just like pictures. One, Elfman's quit. Yeah. You're using like Getty images. Yeah. It's a little, it and feels, it's, it's kind of samey. Right. It's kind of the, yeah. And then you have this weird like, I'm Spider-Man. Everything's growing great. He does not put on the suit until 35 minutes into the movie, which is kind of crazy, considering the movie starts out with, I'm Spider-Man, everyone loves me, everything's going great. Is that because the first fight with Harry, he's yeah. not wearing the suit? Yeah. Right? yeah. So when it gets to the first fight sequence, 20 minutes <laughs> in, he's funny, wearing Harry civilian just shows up. Yes. And he's like, come on, Harry. And he's like, what did you think? I wasn't going to do this? <laughs> like, like, did you see the last movie? But like, This is the whole idea. Yeah. He, he puts on the suit like 35 minutes in the scene where he's talking to Mary Jane, and he's like, sorry, gotta go. And then really the and first... she's like, I hate being married to Spider-Man. The like, first sequence where he's really media. Spider-Man is the, the press conference or whatever, the key to the city thing. Yeah. It takes so long for him to be Spider-Man considering the movie is like, I've nailed it. I figured out how to be Spider-Man. We don't get to see any of him just doing it well before things start going kind of poorly for him. David. Yeah. I got some bad news. Ah. Uh, Hate bad news. All right, go on. Truly rotten news, in my opinion. Okay. Summer doesn't last forever. What? I know. I just heard about this. I just heard about this. With everything going on in the world right now, it it was the last thing I wanted to hear. I was planning on spending summer, you know, to meal plan and grocery shop and cook because I assumed it was going to last forever. Right. You assumed those were two things that you would be doing at Infinium. Right. So now what do I do? I'm, uh, I'm, uh, my plans are in disarray. Well, here's what I suggest, okay? You can't solve the length of the summer. No, that would be, that would be quite difficult. We cannot write, rewrite the calendar. We can't. Uh, Lord knows the seasons are already wacky enough as they are, okay? Here's what you can do. You can use Splendid Spoon. To save yourself more time, time that you would have used on meal planning, and instead use that time to enjoy the summer while it is here. Feel great with plant-based meals that require zero prep time, because Splendid Spoon sends delicious, plant-based, ready-to-eat meals and snacks right to your door, that door surrounded by a beautiful lawn. Uh, that, yes, of course, the lovely lawn door. Mm-hmm. Uh, Splendid Spoon's really nice. Uh, we both sampled the ingredients fit the, right the meals, to my daily routine it fit the smooth right in there you know they got some really nice stuff i'm looking at i'm looking at their recent offerings but i'm a big fan of the vegetable bolognese bowl i'm a big fan of their almond smoothies oh tomato quinoa chili soup that actually looks pretty Dra- good dragon fruit berry Look, smoothie i like they got a lot of noodles you know i feel like a lot of these yeah, healthy yeah, meal plans these bowls they move away from the noodle noodles may be my favorite form factor a food can take um yes uh so look the thing with splendid spoon meals is they're shipped right to your door ready to eat you only lift a finger to press start in your microwave they fit into any schedule there's a meal plan for everyone and every meal plan is customizable, so you get what you want every time. It's all 100% plant-based. It's gluten-free. It's GMO-free. Got plenty of veggies, legumes, healthy fats, whole grains, 
and spices from all over the world. And David, eating plant-based food can come with a wealth of benefits such as improved energy, sleep, digestion, and complexion. Four things that have haunted me for most of my adult life. Uh, that's great. Uh, and I, I, I want them to no longer haunt you. Thank you. Look, you can eat well and enjoy more, more of your summer with Splendid Spoon. Get started today and save on an entire week of ready-made plant-based meals. Just go to SplendidSpoon.com slash check for $50 off your first box when you subscribe. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of money, actually. That's $50 off at SplendidSpoon.com slash check. That's like uh, 10, 10 five spots or five ten spots. Both true. So Topher Grace, staunch defender of the film. I know the movie did well for Sony. I know people weren't happy about it. I think Sam is so talented. I remember one time I was on ninth unit. Mm. Ninth unit. It's like he's running a small country. Uh, I'd love to see anyone slamming one of these movies try to fit into Sam Raimi's position. He was like the president of a country. And the movie had the gross national income of a small country. I have huge respect for him. I think he did a fantastic job on that trilogy. So he just... You know who else loved being in this movie, though? Who? Bryce Dallas Howard. Really? Yeah, because she was basically just like, one, why are you casting me? I'm sure. not a blonde. No. And I'm not, like, I don't feel like I fit the profile of this They cast character. a blonde to play a redhead and a redhead to play a blonde. She's one of the few this redheads of prominence in that's, Hollywood. That's a Laura Ziskind joke. Yes. My joke is I cast a blonde as a redhead and a redhead as a blonde. Well, five comedy points to Laura Ziskind, R.I.P. Um, uh, but Howard basically, and I guess this vibes with her now where she mm -hmm. basically is clearly more interested in making movies than being in them. She, the way she talks about it, she's just like, it was so cool to be on those giant sets yeah. like, and see uh, the whole collaborative process of making a movie like that. It has always felt like her involvement in the Jurassic World trilogy is more about her trying to learn everything she can yeah. to get ready to, to do the, the big dance. Um, Which, look, her Mandalorian episodes have been great. Yeah, she's definitely going to get some big movie. Yeah. She clearly wants to make one, yeah. so she's gonna, I think that job is coming for her. But like other elements where you're just like, when Dylan Baker is cast as Kurt Connors in two, you're like, Fucking great. Yeah. Great it job. It is incredible. The entire casting. time watching the movies with my wife, I was like doing the whole like that's chappy with her. So, so, <laughs> so like, you know, Dylan Baker shows up. I'm like, that's that's the lizard. She's that's, like, who the, who, yeah. who the hell is the lizard? Yeah. Well, but, he's Kurt Connors. You but know? like he's, Dylan Baker rules. It's such good casting. And I love the idea of just keeping him there simmering for a little while, having him be like an ally, a mentor right. that can exist for a little bit. But you're so annoyed that they don't let him do it in this movie. You're so annoyed when you read that it was not part of any plan for four. What were you going to say about him? I was going to say how much I love Dylan Baker in that role and sort of it's again, you can imagine a future movie or whatever, but like this, the thing, okay, so the thing I like about the Raimi movies is really about how all the villains have some personal relationship to Peter. Agreed. They're not just thing, they're not just like entities that come out of the sky. They're yes. not just sort of like, you know, you know, malevolent forces. They're specific people who have specific relationships with Peter. And part of the challenge of them for Peter is sort of like, I actually care about this person in some and way. And all of them are like tragic monsters. It's right. that thing that No Way Home, to its credit, kind of identifies, which is like, oh, all these guys have like a tragic accident. Right. And, and so, is there still a humanity in there we can salvage? And so with, with, with Kurt Connors, Dylan, it's sort of it would have been great to have a film where you have that dynamic play again. Here is a yes. mentor, someone who cares about Peter, and Peter cares about him, and he has to deal with this horrible thing that's happened to him. And especially when like Spider Man Two does it incredibly well, but Spider Man Two has to introduce him, right, and have him turn and redeem himself in one movie. The idea of letting Baker just hang out there, yeah, and then the indignity of the second they hit the reset button, they're like, "By the way, we're finally doing Lizard." Here's my question, and I like. The casting of Dylan Baker, and I love Dylan Baker. Yeah. Do you feel like there's a 50 50 shot they would have made Spider Man for and been like, he's still in it? Don't worry, Dylan. We're, we're, we'll, we'll do Lizard. We'll do Lizard. Or were they definitely going to no, do no, Lizard? No, no. Everything Raimi has talked about with Spider Man 4 did not include Lizard. Exactly. Yeah. It was. So it was funny where they're like, and now our new villains, the Vulture. It was Vulture and Black Cat. Bla Black Cat or Slash Felicia Hardy, exactly, was going to have some sort of right. thing. Right? But it was, it was going to be Anne Hathaway playing a Felicia Hardy type right. vulture. And then Bruce Campbell at certain stages was going to play Mysterio. Was, in a sort of jokey cameo version. It would have yes. been the opening of the movie right. is, is him but, busting. Like, and it but is, I, never, ever heard anything about fucking Lizard in that movie. And even he was like, we toyed around with Craven. Lizard never right. seemed Craven to be was something he wants any to do. And it is so funny because they would have just kept him there for five. You think about it, and it's like at the time, 
the beef that the studio had with Raimi was like, stop doing these fucking boring yeah. 60s films. Vulture, an old guy? Right. Like, that's what you want to do? And then, of course, by the time it comes around to the MCU, they're like, we're going to do Vulture. Right. Michael Keaton will be playing the Vulture. Mysterio, like they're, they're doing all, all that stuff come around. Right. Yeah, yeah, like, I mean, yeah it, it's sort of, it's just because these movies are in this kind of weird in-between zone yeah. where it's like studios don't seem as if they trust that audiences are really going to go for... The, the the lame '60s stuff, but by the time we get to the 2010s, it's very apparent that like yeah, you can you can throw like a, a fucking raccoon on screen and people and like, people will lose good. their minds. Right. But yes. You know what's most confounding about it to me that attitude is that yes, obviously Venom has popped so hard in the '90s. He is the freshest villain, right? There is a generational excitement about him. Yeah, he's he's got a bad attitude. But as Ben is illustrating very well, all these '60s villains were still. On the cartoon show that was incredibly Absolutely. popular yes. in the nineties, yeah. they were in the comics. They're in all the video games. In the video games, right? One hundred percent. So, like, if you're a kid watching at this point, maybe Venom is like the the hot new right dude. But like, you're, but you're still familiar. You're with, familiar with the Rhino, with Scorpion, with, with all, all those these guys. guys. Yeah, yeah, I think the reason that Vulture really got on their nerves was that he's an old. Raimi was like, I'm so I'm looking at right a bunch of guys right. in their fifties and sixties, and they were like, I swear to God, like we told you, millennial villains. I like, I believe. Right. I, I mean, perhaps this is apocryphal, but I believe I've heard an interview where he did confirm this. That like at one point Sam Raimi took a meeting with Larry David, and Sony was like, D -g -g "Fucking stop it!" <laughs> that definitely is ten out of ten. I mean, Best picture it would be right. so yeah. good. Watch, that he watched. did the meeting with Larry David. Larry David was like, "Why would anyone would have gone I, to the movie four times about? in yeah. theaters?" Yeah, Larry David Vulture, perfect. But perfect Sony casting. was like, "Absolutely <laughs> not." If it's an old guy, it has to be an old guy who has been nominated for an Oscar. I don't. I don't know. Are I don't. Not think finding this any is evidence. Real. I'm only finding like fantasy casting stuff, which I love it. <laughs> I feel like I read something where he was like, they, "I mean, it would be great." Yeah. Obviously, which this they did not do with Keaton. The idea of the Vulture usually is that he's an old guy who like is trying to suck out your energy to get yeah. young again right like, which but they never did that with keaton and no. said he was just a guy he salvages parts right? yeah he was like a you know he was an attleboro trump voter he yeah. was like a trump guy where he was yeah, yeah. like look i'm just a blue collar guy and it's like aren't you like a millionaire and he's Forgotten like shut American. up <laughs> <laughs> <Your suit. Yeah. laughs> well one thing i i wanted to ask you guys about while we're talking about the m the contemporary mcu mm -hmm. um when peter's emo Right? And he's emo mode. Bully That's... Maguire, as the kids like to call him. The Zoomers call him Bully Maguire. Bully Maguire. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Huge in, in gifts. Right. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. His hair changes. It gets all right. floppy. Bully Maguire. Yeah. It gets floppy. Uh -huh. It definitely looks like he listens to Dashboard right. Confessional. Yeah, exactly. He's yeah. got right. well, a Thursday price. Right. And he yeah. dances like this. Uh, for the listener at home, David's doing the dance. <laughs> uh, and all that, yes. There's this moment where he is on the phone and he's talking to the landlord's daughter it and it's kind of like, yeah. he's playing for comedy as that, you know, type of character. The, or, the you most, know what I mean? That he's in that transformation. The most of a badass asshole Peter Parker can be is asking her for more milk. More milk and cookies. Right. He's like, like eating the cookies. Yeah. and But he's acting like an asshole. Yes. Right? And yeah. it's like, that's what they're telegraphing. And I'm like, this is what the MCU comedy is now. They all act like this. I think that's right. I think, I think, oh, I think you're saying all, their default yeah, state. The yeah, default the default comedy state is, is sort of just like assholes. They're, they're all kind of yeah. snarky Quippy and sarcastic. Well, yeah. it's the Robert Downey yeah. Jr. effect. Right. right. No. Right. Oh, actually, that's, and it, and that's it's, really and interesting. It's yeah. Part of the huh. magic of getting someone like you to enjoy a movie like that is that they can look at the camera and be like, look, I know this is all pretty yeah, silly. Right. Right. Yeah. Come on, Iron Man. Yeah, whatever. Right. Like, you know, yeah. <laughs> Avengers. I guess I'm an Avenger. Like, whatever. It just felt interesting to be like, the movie's telling me that he's acting like an asshole, but when I see this play just anywhere <laughs> else now it's like well this is the good guy right. hero that we all love it, it's funny it, it, it's even like in the mcu it's not even like different kinds of assholes the same it's the same kind like uh this is my big complaint i really like uh i, I like that first doctor strange movie quite a bit same. but what it's i do not like is how uh steven strange is just uh, uh, Robert Downey Jr. is Tony Stark. It's the single biggest problem with that movie. It's, yeah, and and I will say, I think Raimi kind of correct. Right, we we were talking about this after Strange Two. Like, I do feel like he's settled quite well into the role for that, and I do think Raimi's a part of that. Because like, yeah. I thought he was it's better. Way less of the like, I need to be Robert right. Downey yeah. Jr. Because like, I, yeah. I thought he was better in Infinity War, and then worse again in No Way Home. They can't decide how much they want him to be snarky quipster, and it felt like Raimi settled him into like, you are aloof weirdo. Yeah. You can be funny and you can be arrogant, 
but you're not like snarky. Right. Like Stephen Strange is arrogant yes. and unpleasant. Right. But he's yeah. not he's not like he's, he's not a good hang. No. Yeah. But I, I think like, yeah, yeah, no one would willingly yeah. spend time with yeah, Stephen Strange. Yeah, why would Strange. you hang out with this yeah. guy? <laughs> I have complaints about the movie, but I think like yes. I think he's actually really good in the Multiverse movie. of Madness gets that right. But, and it it is funny that in when this movie is playing in theaters, Ben, people are like what the fuck am I watching? The evil version of this character asks for more cookies? <laughs> and you're watching Again, for, like, for this poor is the Ursula. status just, quo of all characters. Poor Ursula just wants just wants to hang out with Peter. She I, just likes him. I love Ursula too. I know. I mean, it's nice that she comes back, but right, she really doesn't get enough to do. Can but I at least she has a little moment. What? Can I talk editor's cut for a few moments here? Of course, you can yeah. in a second, but okay. wait. Yeah, I want to yeah, first no, give you, talking anything. about the dancing, since we're on yeah. it, Esther Zuckerman, friend of the show. The great Esther Zuckerman. Recently published. Have you read this yet? The I just, uh, I, yeah, oral I, history yeah, I of the yeah. advanced sequences in Spider-Man 3. Yeah. Uh, where she talks to Marguerite Derricks, who choreographed the dance. But of course, her main job was choreographing the big jazz scene, right? Like, that's the major dance number. Right. Did she choreograph the Broadway number? I well? think I so. guess she just walked downstairs. Right. But okay. her main, that, exactly. She's brought on board to do choreography. But obviously, the centerpiece is the sure. whole jazz sequence yeah. with their, you know, uh, where their the club. Which, once again, just a thing you cannot imagine if the director of your third superhero movie comes in. He's like, by the way, we really need to bring choreographer in for this. I have a huge dance number planned. <laughs> <laughs> but hey, man, you've done two hits. Yeah. Um. The original idea, she says, was that Toby <laughs> was going to be like a b-boy spinning on his head and doing break dancing. Great mm. choice. Would have watched it. <laughs> like evil Toby, yeah, which yeah. is in incredible to consider. Yes. And then she said that McGuire was really resistant. And then she started giving him, she went to his house to train him, started giving him like Fred Astaire moves. Yeah. And he loved them mm. and lit up and was like, I want to do this. This is fun. So it it feels like because like you're saying like people are watching this and like what is this dorky shit like you know no one behaves this way anymore but it's like McGuire actually liked yes that kind of movement like that it, it was, you know it, can I say it makes sense for the character since he was perfect, raised by old it people. does sense. right like I, it, he is a kid who would have been watching a bunch yeah. of Fred Astaire movies and just had that in the back of his head there are so many valid complaints of this movie. But it was always the thing that pissed me off the most was it felt like so much of the the public's response at the time of its release, and you could feel it in the theater, as you said, David, yeah. was the sense of like, what the fuck is Tobey Maguire doing? Does he think this looks cool? Right. And that it felt like no one was giving Tobey Maguire credit for being funny, that they assumed he was failing to be cool, um, which it's right, like, right, right, it, right. He's, he's a guy who's stuck perpetually in this weird 60s version of America raised by old people with very simple values. Like, of course he doesn't know how to fucking be sexy. There's, there's a tiny moment when he goes into the club with Gwen Stacy, right? Which is just like such an unappealing asshole thing to do. His whole attitude of it, her going like, you're, isn't that your ex girl? Don't you not want to be here? He's like, no, no, that's fine. I got this figured out. But there's the moment where he goes over to like the hostess and he slips her some money and she gives him this look of sort of like, yes. yeah, right. It's like, even in just that one shot, Raimi lets it be undercut for a second where right. it's like, this isn't working on anyone. Right. It's not yeah. like people are like, oh my God, Even so cool. When Stacey's right. going yeah. out with him because she liked him in class. Right. She doesn't like this. She doesn't. No, no one, one likes, likes this. this. Who would like this? <laughs> it's not successful. Like, I'm sure Ursula. there are people who like it and I salute you. Any listener who saw Tobey Maguire looking like that in the movie and was like, this is a sexual awakening for me. I doff my cap to you. Like, I'm sure uh, someone's out there like that. I, I appreciate it's that. Funny. In, in Esther's piece, she... Uh, I guess the the makeup artist says that people say that they were it was like a My Chemical Romance look, but My yeah. Chemical Romance wasn't actually on the scene yet. Right. And I was trying to think of who the Tobey Maguire looked like in that in that uh, emo Tony the emo Toby. Yeah. He looks like Julian Casablancas from The Strokes. Very good call. Oh yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. That's sort of right. You know, the, especially the language yeah. hair. But that, the, right. that really yeah. the, the bags the under the eyes. The, bags right. under the hair she's dangling on over one right. eye. Right. The, she also says like, "There's not eyeshadow. Like people yeah. think he's wearing eyeliner or whatever. He's not. I just made his eyes look really sunken. Like yeah. I, I tried to make him anyway. Yeah. Talk about the editor's cut, which I've never watched. Is it on the disc? It is. I think it's it's disc four. It's on the bonus. I, I have one have, of those. We all books. have the four K box at the, exactly. the book. Yeah, right? No, I, I don't have the book. I have like they released a four K box, a four K, just like it's the three disc with no special features. Oh, I okay. I think I very, that's I was very upset about it. Hey, um, but I, I have all the digital copies anyway, and all okay. the special features are in the digital ones. So. so Bob Morowski, who's one of Ramey's regular collaborators, mm -hmm. 
through to Doctor Strange. I, I don't remember which ones he didn't work on, but has worked on a number of the Raimi movies. Yeah. This movie comes out, Raimi's sort of very quickly like, it got away from me, I'm apologetic. When he's talking about wanting to make four, he's like, I know I fucked it up, I have to prove myself. There were always things that were like in the trailers that weren't in the movie, things that actors would talk about having shot, stills that came out and they'd be like, you know, as often as the case, like the fucking images that exist of like the quote unquote Schumacher cut of Batman Forever. Fans want to believe there is a cut of a movie that fundamentally solves it and fixes everything they just Right, and then there are things like that Daredevil cut. Right. Like, which is like one of those classic things where I'm like, yes, this is better. It makes it 5% better. But like, the, it the, is now everything I don't like about this movie, good. like the actors are still right. in it or whatever. Right? right. It's like some of this is unfixable. Yeah. Right. So I think, especially people who thought that this movie was too goofy, assumed there was some cut that could salvage it. Right. Right? Um, like 10 years later, 2017, I guess it's when Homecoming's coming out? Sure, that sounds right. They yeah. re-released these movies on 4K for the first time. And there had been this rumor of, like, is Sony doing an extended cut of Spider-Man 3? There's the 2.1 cut, which is not good, which actually makes the movie worse. Which is horrible. Yes. I do not watch it ever. No. So what's, what's different about the 2.1 it, cut? It's so bad. It, 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 it has includes like that stupid scene with Jameson scenes. wearing the, um, the suit. Yes. And like, yeah, it, right, it throws in deleted it scenes. It fucks up the timing. It stretches out the house sparks and the elevator thing for an additional two minutes. Like it, it just, it, it adds in a couple weird things, but also ruins the perfect diamond cut timing of a couple things from the original movie. Right. It absolutely is just emblematic of the pox of every movie needs to have an unrated out of control cut. And there was no unrated cut. So they were like, it's just longer now. And the, the J. Jones Jameson scene is a scene that, Sam, like, Raimi himself admitted, we thought it was funny on paper, and then when I watched Just it, I was like, work. this isn't funny. Right, right. But anyway, the Spider-Man, the editor's cut of Spider-Man 3. Right? Right. There's no director's cut. There's no extended cut. And Those I think Raimi was just like, I'm so haunted by this Not fucking interested. thing. Right. I yeah. don't want to touch it. And at some point, there are these rumors of, like, Murasky might be working on a cut. There might be someone trying to, like, restore some sort of vision of the thing. And then, like, a month before that 4K box set comes out, it just goes up on Amazon. It's like rentable on Amazon. Right. You can just, right. Yeah. It just and says, it's not longer. If anything, it's maybe it's a couple a minute minutes longer. shorter. Right. Yeah. Okay. It's or maybe, a minute shorter. It's but a it, different. It swaps out a ton of stuff, essentially. Alternate takes. Right. A bunch right. of different things. But it goes up with a little fanfare. Then it's a bonus on that disc. And it's sort of like never got a ton of attention. And because it was an editor's cut, people were like, how valid is this? And he's been very much like, look, I just think there's a better version of the movie than what we had to rush to put out. I tried to salvage it. This represents my opinion and not me trying to restore. Sam's idea. Right. And he edited Doctor Strange, so it's not like Sam and he no, had fallen out. Absolutely. Right? But a lot of alternate takes. It adds a couple things. It cuts a lot of the worst scenes out of the movie. Right. Which I will go over. The other thing is, it like has a pretty different score. Mm. I think Christopher Young's score was like redone a lot, and then Sony came in with notes and added, it said, we want this emotion instead of this emotion. There was a score that helps settle the tone of the movie a lot more and makes it feel more cohesive as do the sort of alternate takes in certain cases. Two huge things that are cut. It cuts the entire butler scene. Good. It's a tough scene. The worst <laughs> scene in the movie. It's, it's, it's it tough. doesn't help. This maybe is very superficial, but it doesn't help that the butler has like this flat Midwestern accent. <laughs> do you know who the butler is? It's um, Bill Paxton's, Paxton's dad. dad. Yeah. Oh, that's funny. I didn't know that. But uh, if the butler, every time, he, every time he shows up on screen and he's about to open his mouth, I'm like, oh, he's going to have... Like a, like a re received pronunciation, right. and then he's Master like, Hello, Hello, sir. Yeah. but then he's like uh, Harry. Yeah, <laughs> me, Harry, Harry. For people who don't remember, there's a scene where the butler, at the end of three movies, essentially decides to be like, eh, FYI, I've been here the whole time. I knew the whole thing. I never said anything. Right, your dad died on his yeah. own glider or whatever. Right. Spider Man didn't kill him. So in Spider Man Two, Otto Octavius is trying, <laughs> like he just runs through all the scenes that Harry wasn't there for. Um, they cut that scene out entirely. Uh -huh. The way that moment plays is. Peter comes through, makes the plea to Harry, sees how scarred he is. Harry sort of has his, like, clenched emotions. Peter leaves. He looks down at the picture frame of the three of them together with cracked glass over it, and he looks at it and cries and then looks up. And it is just a much subtler, better yeah. much, 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 much better simpler, just yeah. the thing that brings him back is because Peter has been arguing for his innocence this entire time. Either he's going to believe Peter or not. The butler saying this is just way too much to throw on him. The thing that works is because Peter's plea is, do it for MJ. I don't care if you hate me. MJ is in danger. 
he looks back down at the photo and he remembers like, God, how far have things gotten away from us? What insane like fucking lives we now live. We, we, I, this is what matters. And it makes, I think Harry's death also, I find something kind of touching about that final sort of moment of the three of them as the sun is rising, sort of all holding each other, just being like, it feels like a less cynical version of the Starship Troopers thing. Yeah. Where all three of them end up together at the end and they're like, how crazy, right? Like five years ago we were kids. Right, right, right. Now we have all these adult problems and one of us is dead, <laughs> you know? But I right. like that it just regrounds into that thing. There's the the second Aunt May scene. They cut out entirely as well. Mm-hmm. The one about like the guilt. Yes. Right. He is like, the whole point of this was my fucking daughter and I can't even right. see her anymore. I'm a monster now. Everyone knows me in the press as this criminal or whatever. And uh, it's it's Teresa Russell and the daughter uh, who had a run where she was Steve Jobs' daughter, Sandman's daughter, and and the bride's daughter in Kill Bill Volume 2. Oh, really? Wait, Steve Jobs' daughter? She's the oldest Jobs, Jobs' daughter oh, in Oh, Steve I see. Jobs. So years later. I was just saying, because that movie's later. Right? No, yeah, I know. Yeah, she's right. the oldest. She's the final daughter in that movie. Yeah. The final daughter. The final, final daughter. daughter. Yeah. Um, uh, Perla. Harley Jardine. Jardine. Yeah. yeah. Um. They're sitting on a bench, and and Teresa Russell's like, you need to understand, your dad's like a fuck-up. He fundamentally fucks everything up. You cannot rely on him. Even if he's trying his best, he's going to hurt you. You don't want him in your life. And she, like, gets up and sort of, like, hobbles over and sees the sand castle and can tell that it's him and, like, touches it and sort of has the moment of, like, I understand that he's trying. And the mom doesn't see it. She looks back to her mom. She looks over. The sand castle's gone. And it's, like, a nice little thing. There are just some little character moments like that. that they reinstate. There are the clunkiest sort of overwritten scenes. They all take out. There are alternate takes and score cues that just tonally, like, flatten it out. They also take out a lot of Eddie Brock. Right. right. They sort of strip it down to the bare minimum. But I do think it flows better. It's not a fundamentally different movie. I think it's just a little bit more consistent. It is a cut done by someone who doesn't have studio executives breathing down their neck and has a little more time to think over it. Um, the only mistake I think it makes is it, it changes the fucking cue at the end of the movie so it isn't the Elfman theme and it's some other piece of instrumentation that's not as iconic and and resonant can we talk about the best scene in this entire movie okay. yes what's the best scene in this birth of the sandman movie? it is pretty good do you think that's the best scene in the entire movie is it birth of the sandman yeah the 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 him trying yes, to yes, reconstitute yeah. himself yeah i mean i love that scene or, or i yeah. really like that scene i don't know if i love it i love that scene movie. right but it's great it's a very griffin scene in that it's like this sort of miraculous technological scene as well I mean, I, I think... But it's I think, also a very universal monster. Like, oh, that's the, right. The, the hand. Yeah, what? what, what? Go ahead. No, I, I just... I, th- I, th- I, think my, I think actually my favorite scene in, in the, my favorite scene sequence in the movie is the is the James Brown... You right. Know, I, I th- think that is sort I, of I think, I think that sort of is sort of like the... It's it, the boldest thing in the right, movie. But right. the Sandman thing is sort of similarly bold. Yeah. What, why Why? do you love that apart from the sort of... Is it? Is it the kind of like universal monster tragic the, thing? There's also... I mean, it, part of, part of I guess, how uh, Tom St. George acts it is as when he's first dissolving the sand, his face is sort of like... This, yes. He's like horrified. Yes. He's like, I'm dying. It's like, I'm dying. Yeah, yes. it's a kind of crestfallen. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think it's a complete story, the scene in and of itself, right? The fact that like it speaks to the sort of... Raimi at his best, his sort of incredibly clean expressiveness, that the scene is driven by a character who is struggling to even be able to uh, create recognizable human uh, expressions, that you're like projecting these emotions onto a a pretty formless mound of shit. Yeah. Uh, And that going from like the individual grain to then seeing the entire sort of silo of the sand the, like, struggle to get his fingers to maintain integrity, the, like, the the entire internal journey of it without any narration or whatever, I think that's also, like, the best track in the score, which, watching the editor's cut, I do think the score is pretty good. Like, you know, the Raimi... I always dinged it for not being Raimi, but I think the Sandman theme is good. I think that theme in particular is good. You mean Elfman, not Raimi. I'm sorry. That's what I mean. But there's this uh, Anthony Lane's review of this movie when it came out. Okay. The opening paragraph was all about that scene, uh-huh. right? And just kind of how incredible uh, it is. And the opening sentence of his review is, there's one great scene in Spider-Man 3, and you can pretty much leave the theater once it's over. 
But for those three or four minutes, you wouldn't want to be anywhere else. I, it's very compelling. I agree with you. And I think about that line a lot, too, when there's like a movie that doesn't work that can have one scene that is so locked in and such a clean expression of what the person was trying to do that he's literally like, there's nowhere else in the world you'd rather be than watching these two minutes of Spider-Man 3. Okay. But. But. What do we think of Mary Jane's arc in this movie? I like it. Why do you like it? I really like Dunst's performance. I like her performance throughout too. this film. And, and mind you, the thing I just rewatched was the cut that maybe has better takes of her performance. Yeah, sure. I mean, I don't. That's okay. Sure. I don't know. I don't know. I just I felt like in my mind's eye, this movie fell prey to the plot line that is always dicey. Of like, uh, the girlfriend's upset she's not getting enough attention. Yes. Yes. It's a bad plot line. It's a bad plot line. Yeah. And then she doesn't get anything to do. I think she plays it incredibly well. Yes. She's a good actress, but yeah. the character is horribly underserved. And then, like, she's jealous of Gwen Stacy, who's a non character. And it, it all just feels like she's behaving stupidly. And sure. I feel like it's a, like, it's not a good way to treat her character. Well, this is the other. She's not well treated in the first movie. You know, it's like Mary Jane's sort of inconsistent because often she has to be the the thing to rescue sure. or the the thing between her and, and him and Harry or whatever, right? Like, you know, it's a lot of that. But I think this one is so much about her trying to I like to her out. scene with Harry when they're cooking. I was going to yes, say. I think that's, that's a great scene. Good, this yeah. is like, a place that's where there's you, some juice. Right. I, right. I also think Franco's good in this movie. He, I, I really, I, he's, we were he's a real feast or famine actor for yeah. me. I said that to you. And I more often than not dislike him. I really like him in one and two. I like his sort of weird yes. Harry in general. Yeah. His weird take on Harry, which is kind of like, Aloof rich kid who doesn't know how to fit in thing. Right. Who's handsome, but also an alien, right? Yeah. yeah. And then this one, I feel like he's good when he's doing that. But I feel like he's kind of like bored when he's in like evil goblin mode. Like, quote unquote, you know, like when he's... Yes. Which is how I feel about him in Oz and how I feel about him in like almost in Planet of the Apes. Well, that's... Almost any yes. blockbuster he was in where I was just kind of like, are you bored? Like he, all of a yes. sudden that weird thing with Franco. I mean, those like, in... Where he's suddenly yes. dead behind the eyes. In Rise and Oz, they are performances that actually like make me angry. Where I'm like, let someone else yes, do uh, this. Someone might enjoy doing this. Someone game. would it's, enjoy it's doing this. how people felt about him at the Oscars. Right. They will right. at least enjoy making this money, you ungrateful fuck. <laughs> <laughs> who's gonna like make this film and then talk about why like well I knew it was bad but I thought it was an interesting statement to be in a film like this while I'm also teaching a class on being in movies that suck or whatever and I'm like fuck you right I think yeah. he's less comfortable with the new goblin-y stuff I do like everything after he gets scarred when he sort of once again becomes more tragic universal monster I enjoy hero. his, uh, do you the, guys like his, the amnesia. you know, messed up face? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, well the amnesia. I oh, think yeah, all yeah. the amnesia the stuff amnesia is fun. really well, and this is <laughs> that is so comic book. Even it's like the doctor's like, I don't know what to tell you. He's the normal guy, except he just doesn't remember like the last six or seven issues. <laughs> like, Peter, you know, like, my you know. friend, my best friend, <laughs> Peter. I love you. Or we we just graduated high yeah. school, right? That was my dad. That thing where the no, nurse he, is like, those are good friends. He's like, not good friend. Best friend. <laughs> his messed up face looks good. Really good. I like his yeah. messed up face. And I think. I think it kind of is messed up. Franco, like you're like shit. Franco leans into the sort of James Deaniness of it, yes, then, right. which, it, which he's so good at, right? And and I I think once again it's like the stuff with Mary and Harry, Mary Jane and Harry is fun to me because it gets back to this thing of just like fuck. We were so miserable and angsty when we were teenagers, and that feeling where you're like in your mid to late twenties and you're like, I didn't realize how good I had it. Yeah, yeah. we're hot. Right. I like it when he says, do you like peppers? And she's like, I love peppers. And I'm like, no one's ever said that. No one, no one loves. <laughs> that, that feeling of Mary Jane, like, Ooh, give me a bell pepper, baby. Holding all this weird information, knowing that he's got amnesia and this isn't real, but being like, wouldn't it be nice to just pretend that it was just this again? This Peter thing's like not fucking working. I don't know. I think she's good. And I do just. She's great. Yeah, I think I think my my trouble I have no beef with her performance. It, it, is yeah. I, I'm so I think her performance is very good, and I think she's just like very good at playing, you know, moments where you could play big, she plays small. Yeah, and I think that's sort of like kind of her power. Like she knows how to just like really modulate yeah. the emotions while still delivering the impact of a big performance. Yeah. Um, and so I sort of did not pay. Sort of like yeah, she's. In this movie, more than the other, more than the other ones, she's very like either damsel in distress, which she often is, obviously, yeah, right. or right. or a drag, or, or a drag, like, yeah, you know, like, yeah. And I, I think there's probably a way to do the Peter's not paying attention enough to me uh, story, and just have it be 
a little more nuanced, a little less sort of like I need attention, a little more sort of like you're not Here, tending this relationship. Here's how you do it. You yeah. take a villain out. Because the reason yeah. yeah. anytime she's like, I just feel like you're not paying attention to me, I'm like, Mary Jane, too much is going like I, the viewer, I'm like, what do you mean? Mary Jane. Busy. Have like, you read this script? <laughs> right. Um, right, right. You take a villain out yeah. and sort of like it's the dilemma Give becomes it a little room, just room sort of to like, breathe. right? And I, th- I think this is, I think this is kind of what they were going for, right? That like Peter becomes so self-absorbed right. about being Spider-Man that he just ceases to tend. It's an these absolute power corrupts absolutely. Right, like right. what keeps Spider-Man Spider-Man is that he's humbled constantly by right. the universe. Okay. That, well, no, no, okay. Go ahead, go ahead. Can I just say fame praise a word? Because I think I've identified what I do marginally like about this, and it's purely an execution, and most and of the I credit Mary goes Jane to question. Mary go Jane, yeah, uh, to Dunst in her performance. I think what I like is that she never has the you're not paying attention to me blow up scene. Yeah. Which is the scene that always like nails on a chalkboard feels like all you know how to do is turn the woman into a harpy sort of emotionally unsatisfied, whatever. I like that the more he starts feeling himself getting absorbed with all this stuff, she just pulls back. And that is just this thing of like, he doesn't realize that she has been fired from the play until an hour and 30 okay, minutes. This is my question. In. This and is she my just question. goes like, if you're not going to pay attention, no. I don't want to burden you. We I guess I'll just be this. sad. No, but we have to talk about this. All right. Do you guys think she's bad in the play? Like, how bad is she in the play? Because we see her perform and yeah. it's a nice little number. I think it's nice. So how can she be so bad that they fired her from a Broadway show. She's a union actor. Yeah. That is hard to do. They are replacing her name on the damn marquee. Yeah. <laughs> like one performance in. How bad was she? Did she like fall over in act two? I, I can't get over it that they fire her. It's crazy. Explain it to me now. Go. I, look, I, I think the only way it works is if you have to imagine that she's like this weird it girl and they're like, now she's going to do a musical. And Kirsten Dunst has a nice singing voice, but a very particular kind of like Zoe Deschanel esque singing yeah, it's voice. It's a little one, a yes, little, right, a little, right, yeah, right. And that they're sitting there and they're like, "We put this young star they fired her in this show, and she's not giving us fireworks." And the reviews were bad. You, you don't fire someone for bad reviews. I, I wouldn't. This industry is brutal. Okay. Like uh, I think you like the Mary Jane because of what I like about the Mary Jane with the last scene. Is so nice. It's very, and it's so very lovely. And I actually, of, I had forgotten you know, that it ended like that. It's, like, it's, it's such a, an it's such a crazy way for way. a movie like this yeah. to end, especially right. when you're like, this is the end of his trilogy, whether or not that was his intention right. at the time. Now you still have to think he had to create an ending that he knew if I never get to make another one, this is where it is, and that they lend, let it end on the two of them sadly dancing together I, and not even knowing how to talk through their problems anymore. More like I don't know this, and this is why I'm always going to go to bat for this movie Same. because like the ending for me, I'm just like I will forever <laughs> want to defend it because he ended it this way and it cost two hundred fifty million dollars. And it's this, like see, it's, I knew this it's, was it's a the movie. About, and I agree, it's a yeah. movie about fucking people. Yes. Like it's not a movie about. Costumes keeps coming or back like, to the people. You know, purple genocide guys. It's, it's not like, about a hole in the sky. It's it's a movie about <laughs> two kind time. of broken people. Yeah, it, it like at the end of the day, even when you have this crazy, this was like the most expensive movie ever made yeah, 100%. at the time. Yes, it cost. I remember the thing where it leaked out yeah. that it cost two hundred and fifty million dollars, and the response was, "That must be a typo." It is impossible right no movie for a movie to cost right. where does that money go <laughs> and the fact is like even when you get to this crazy end set piece where you have like seven characters all fighting and scaffolding it comes down to like four different apologies need to happen yes right, right. the resolution of every plot line is like you just need to tell that person you're sorry about <laughs> right. this they need to know that you're aware that you hurt their feelings and then you're there. gonna defeat them with church bells or whatever yes. it's fine or, or you know banging sticks together solely apologies god the, the venom death and then it he, ends with like a quiet a quiet but, sad a dance quiet, and, the, sad and, and dance. the ending is so good and yet at the same time i do kind of remember being at the multiplex yep. opening weekend and it ending like that and everyone being like Okay, I guess we'll go. Like, you know, like, right. you know, like, it's certainly the audience was not leaving being like, yeah, Spider Man. <laughs> like, we weren't all. Well, but it's, it's a Raimi throwing the needle thing. I mean, it, you know, another issue with this film is that one exceeded expectations, right? And then two exceeds like all sequel expectations where they're like, holy shit, how did he just perfect this fucking thing? So then I think you have three years of everyone being like, well, Sam Raimi is a genius. Yeah. He is the one person who has figured out exactly how to make these movies. 
he cannot err again. I mean, it's similar to what happened with The Dark Knight Rises. Yes, right? exactly. Which is a movie I think is totally fine. I yeah. liked it when I saw it in theaters, and I will happily revisit it again. I like this more than that, but it's similarly a movie I want to fight for for right. specific reasons of what it tries to do there's even for everything There's things that work. Up. There's things that right. don't work. Right. Yeah. Um, and before we started recording, we talked a little bit about Superman Returns. Yes. Which is another movie that it's not a sequel or anything, but it's like much better than it, it gets credit for. Yeah, and it also one of the weird things about it is that it is yeah, kind yeah of it a is sequel. kind of a sequel, yeah, yeah, right? To a movie that's like four generations. Yeah, yes, I. It, that's it, that's like the whole thing for me is that he still is he's keyed into the basic story he wants to tell here, and even when it gets muddled, the humanity of these central characters. Yeah does basically stay intact and remain the key attraction. Let me give you a quote from Bill Pope, who shot this movie. Uh Shot the last one, too. Yeah. Bill Pope, the legendary Bill Pope. And he talks about a lot of cinematographers who do this. You make a visual flow chart, right? For, like, the moods, how how the atmosphere will be scene by scene, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe colors, things like that. And he was like, Spider-Man, we couldn't do it because the... Uh, emotions and the, there's so many characters who change so much that like there was no way to map it out in a way that looked logical. That's fascinating. And also right. the characters have entirely different color palettes. Yes. You're like exactly. Venom is black, Sandman is like green and yellow, and then New Goblin is like green and black. Green, yeah, kind of steely green. Right. Yeah, right. Like and it's basically he's like there are four characters. They're going either from light to dark or dark to light or light to dark to light or whatever, right? right? But they're all doing it at different times. They're all doing it on different tracks. You have night sequences, you have dawn, you have <laughs> right. dusk, you have morning. The score yeah. keeps, and also the script will keep changing. You yeah. know, like the way he describes it basically does seem to be like new pages are coming in every day where it's yeah. like, no, 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 actually the Green Goblin thing's going to happen over here now or whatever. So I do, this is, that's all the problem. I agree with you what you're saying. The three yeah. main kids. There's something there. Yeah. But everything around it is so noisy in this movie. Yeah. I just think, look, I, I, I'm not going to tell you to do it today because I certainly... Uh, watch the editors. I'll watch the editors. Cut. I just think it's an interesting spin to give at some point because I think, aside from everything else, it, it reorganizes some scenes in a better order as well. It just makes it feel a little less manic. Does it have Venom dive into uh, the bomb to get back into the suit and turn into a skeleton? Yes. I do like that. I like that too. I love that. I, but why I like that is because it does feel like Sam maybe being like, don't ever fucking ask me about Venom again. Yeah. Because initially it seems like, oh, Spider-Man's going to blow up the suit, but Eddie Brock will survive and yeah. we can have a little post credits thing where it's like, oh, there's a blob left. And then Sam Raimi's like, no. <laughs> Eddie Brock dives yeah. in. The whole thing explodes. Right. No more Venom. Right. It, the fundament- you made me do this and I'm not doing it anymore. He refuses to apologize. He refuses to take responsibility. Um, that, that's another thing that's reinstated back into the movie. There's like a montage of like black suit Spider-Man killing it. Which was a bunch of stuff that was in the trailer that yeah, they, they animated that's that. really expensive. Because like you need that. Yeah, I know. It's like weirdly missing, and it's in the editor's cut, and it, it helps the movie. Um, I, well, one thing I want to tell you about in the research, well, the sand, right? They shot a lot of real sand. I guess I didn't know that. Yeah, the thing I remember reading, I don't know if JJ pulled this up, was that they like this. This was such a like tech breakthrough was to try to do the particle physics of Sandman, which are a lot easier, I think, the, to do these days. But that they like studied so many different types of grains to figure out what the Six, best one would be. To- Sixteen types of grains, and they would mix them. And the basic like backbone of this ended up being like ground up corn husks. Ground up corn cobs. I think that was right. for understanding how it affects the body because they were like, we can't yeah. bury someone in sand. Right. <laughs> but we need to bury someone in something. Right. So they did that. But the CGI is also sort of emulating what those look yes. like. Yes. Uh, yeah. And then the symbiote, obviously, I, you know, who cares? I feel like the challenge is how it moves. I like how it moves. I do too. It, I like it, this it sort of has, spindly, webby. It has the, also the vaguely Deadite-esque, like, yeah, turkey sure. jerky movement, which I like. Uh, and, um, uh, and yeah, the other thing right in the research that we have mentioned is Danny Elfman. You mentioned, obviously, Danny Elfman didn't do it, yeah. but he didn't do this movie because he found Spider-Man 2 miserable. Yeah. Uh, it's like my connection with Sam got severed. As far as I'm concerned, he went to sleep. Someone put a pod next to him, and when he awoke, he wasn't the same person I'd known for a decade. Now, look, Danny Elfman will motherfuck someone. <laughs> yeah. I feel like we've encountered it's this dramatic before. Like, yeah. He's kind of a dramatic dude. I, but I, he mad, I think he's mad that he got into the temp score so yes, much and kept yes. being like, get it to sound more like this temp score. And Danny Elfman was like, you're, you're driving me crazy. Okay, this is what happened. Uh, if you watch Spider-Man 2, there's very little new music in it. He essentially makes like a Doc Ock theme that they reuse. 
uh, several yes, times across yeah. the film. But I think what happened, because that movie was on such a tight timeline, it comes out so quickly yeah, yeah, yeah. that they're like editing as they go and they edit it, they cut it to Elfman's score for the first movie. Right. So they reused tracks from the first movie and they played it for him and they went like, we just want you to do music in these five spots. And he's like, I want to do a full score. Let me, if you want something like this in this sequence, I'll do a new version of it. And Raimi was like, okay. And then when they were re-recording, he was like, just do the exact same thing again. <laughs> right. So Raimi like wouldn't let him do new music and essentially married him into old tracks. Like the sequence where Peter's testing his powers out again well, we too. That, we'll right, talk right, about right, that. Yeah, exactly. Um, but, but that that's the crux of the thing there. They reconnect on Oz. They, they're, they're right. They, and they figured it out. Yeah, so whatever. They're fine. But he hates them. Briefly. But, uh, but I do think the young score always felt a little, we have Elfman at home. <laughs> To me, yes, and, and the editor's cut. I do think when you hear his full version of it, it's better. I'm seeing here. I'm sorry, I just got an invitation. Uh, Griffin Newman, J J July 28th, is marrying the Spider Man 3 editor's cut, the Central Park Boathouse. What it's, is this? Look, it's just, it's R wait, my RSVP. Yes, I will attend. Paperless posts. It's not as dramatic as chicken like or fucking fish swing shift or something. What kind of fish are we talking about? Sorry. Just a big old plate of sardines in there, right? <laughs> Stacked up on top of each other and toast. That's very in right now. Yeah, huge. It's people, they're good for omega-3 oils, you know. Jamel, yeah. is there anything in your sort of like grand theory of this yeah. movie that you have not yet presented? Like or your, your sort of grand defense of this movie? Yeah, I, I don't think, I, I think we've sort of hit on all of it. I think my grand defense of this movie is that I will acknowledge the problems. Like they are there and it's silly to pretend like they're not. But Right, it's not like you're like, it's the best of the three. Right, you, right. You, you acknowledge that two is the best and one and three are good with problems. My, right, my, right. my view is that the abysmal reputation this movie has is entirely unjustified. That I when agree. you watch this movie, even if you watch it some, some years removed from the other ones, what you see is uh, still kind of it's still kind of unique in this genre. Mm -hmm. A film about three people in extraordinary circumstances and how they deal with with those extraordinary circumstances and how they affect the relationship. And I think that stuff is very compelling. I think that uh, it remains a, a through line through this movie. I think that even if the, even as the point you've made Griffin a number of times, even if they're never fully able to really kind of connect all these villains to, together in this movie, that there are elements of each storyline that really do work and really do tie in to what Raimi is trying to do with these three movies um, and I think it's entertaining. I mean, like, I think, I think it's broadly entertaining. I, yes. I think if you, if, if you just sort of like let yourself kind of experience the movie and not go into it with what I think a lot of people have, which is like a chip on their shoulder about not getting yeah. the thing that they wanted and just right. sort of take it on its own terms, you'll come away being like, this is a entertaining movie with problems. And honestly, I think it's like better than most of the stuff in the genre that's coming out now. Yeah. It's like, it's it's home cooking as opposed to processed food. Right. Uh, I I also just feel like, I feel like whenever you, uh, uh, people who just made a hit movie do an interview about working on the sequel and trying to develop the script or whatever, they always pay lip service to this thing where like, well, it comes back to, how, can we find a good journey for the character? How do you test the character, right? Really, at the end of the day, it's not about the MacGuffin or the villain. It's about really testing the character. And I think this is a movie where if it has a fundamental failing, it's that they come up with like three different tests for the character. Right. But this movie is not a plot-driven film. It is truly, as are all three Spider-Man movies, extensions of what is the challenge that Peter Parker, a development man, goes through right. in order to gain a greater understanding of himself and his relationships to the people closest to him. And you have sort of three alternate movies in this. Right. It's like him healing his relationship with Harry. Right. Probably the best of the three arts. Yeah. Him coming to understand the Sandman. There's stuff there. The Uncle Ben thing feels a little crowbar. Well, you end. understand from Sony's perspective, at the Harry arc, they're like, that's the thing that's on the table that needs to be resolved. Of course. Yeah. Right. And Raimi is like, Sandman is the thing that would get me the most excited. Right. And then the Venom thing is like, I don't really know what Peter learns there. Don't have venom suits <laughs> avoid those right like i don't really know what he learns well no it's like i it, could have been a huge asshole not letting the the selfishness take over i mean the, it, yeah right. right but i mean like when venom dies i don't know if peter's like oh no well no i think i think what he it's the eddie was so addicted to that fucking feeling right that he's he like i rather, know that feeling it's bad i'd rather die right and and even just Peter, like at the beginning of the movie, when everyone's like celebrating Spider-Man before he puts the the symbiote suit on, 
It's still the fact where it's like, I was buying into the hype so much I wasn't paying attention to my girlfriend getting fired. The, the, like the, I didn't even realize how the venom the venom suit is a amped up version of what he experienced at the beginning of the movie. Yes, right. and it's a failing of the movie that it doesn't really it doesn't make need that a great that no. well. Right, it, it doesn't, doesn't. It doesn't. Yeah. But but again, I think that <laughs> it's all there. The pieces are all it's there. All there. Yeah, and it's all so frustrating. I, I think if this had come out, if this exact movie yeah. had come out in 2019 people would lose their fucking minds finally a superhero movie that cares about the people in this movie absolutely and and well, like sure it would right yeah yeah, yeah just look the beats they've maybe yeah. gotten a little more elegant at like putting these things in with confidence when there's shit like sandman tripping into the the you know the silo or uh the symbiote just happening to land there this movie feels kind of embarrassed and shrugging them off and they're like what are we gonna do it just yeah. we gotta get we gotta get through well, this, and also right? it just has no time like you say it's just gotta exactly move, right yeah. i think something like no way home is as sweaty in the connections and the so coincidences it yes. makes insane like, but yes. it does it with a certain confidence now that all these movies are like you understand we just have to get through this like the fact that the thing it, Peter needs to reset the universe because he fucked up with the college admissions advisor. Yeah. And the thing that makes him realize is go to Dr. Strange is that Halloween decorations are still up and Dracula kind of looks like that, like shit like that. You're just like, this yeah, is but do you insane. know what that movie has that this does that none of these movies have, is that Peter can be like, come on, Dr. Strange. I'm sorry. I gotta do this thing. And Dr. Strange looks at him and he's like, yeah. And you're like, right. Cause they like fought, an alien together. Right. That's what those movies have. Yeah. Is that Benedict Cumberbatch can give him a look and you're like, well, it sucks. I know about the long history bit. of these characters. Right. And it papers over over nonsense. Yes. Right. Well, and Which also, is Dr. Strange I mean, being like, yeah, it's it, a brief little spell. Who cares? It papers it, over the fact that the emotional beats in that movie are entirely derived yes, from stuff correct. like 15 or 20 years Cashing earlier. In on history, right? Right, like it's, right. it's, 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 it's a pure cynical nostalgia play. Yes. And, I mean, I get why people like it. It's I'm the not... sweatiest movie alive. I, I talked about this, but I took my six-year-old cousin to see it. Anytime he asked me a plot question, my answer confused him more <laughs> than what he was originally confused by. I just had to be like, I don't, just fuck. I can tell you what it is. You're not going to be happy. I love my stories, though. It's like a soap opera. Who cares? <laughs> you know? <laughs> there's, like, there's it's just thing. storylines and characters coming back to life. And I think in 2007, people watched alien? this movie and they're like, this is too busy. There's too much going on. What the fuck? And I think now audiences watch something like No Way Home. And when there's like some sweaty rush plot development, they're like, well, of course, because they have to set up seven other characters. I right, understand right. they need to do that. I mean, it, there's it, this it, sort of cynical acceptance of like, I'm fine with seeing the gears of the story machinery. Yeah. If it gets me to the end point. If you ever have me on for like a DC movie or whatever, I will go into a whole rant about this exact thing, about how viewers have turned themselves into like mini studio executives right. and how it is. It's like, I feel like it, I spend too much time on TikTok. And there are so many TikTok videos of people basically doing, well, you know, people say this movie is bad, but what you don't understand yeah. is it's setting up X, Y, and Z. And that's why it's actually good. And the executives are geniuses. And it's like, I don't know what the fuck is wrong with you people. This movie isn't setting up anything. Uh, anything. No, as much as really. it doesn't seem like a definitive end to the Raimi Maguire Spider-Mans. The only thing it's setting up is just like, and Kirk Connors is still just there in the background. But like, as opposed to two, which ends with Mary Jane picking Peter, Lots of people Harry finding the yes. thing, right? All this sort of shit. It's not setting up uh, anything. And I, I, I do just sets up kind of a Sandman movie. I'd say <laughs> yeah, he's out there. I mean, yeah, just, he, he blows he away. away. He blows away. He I mean, blows where, away where, where, the where the does wind. the wind take him? <laughs> That's all I'm saying. Um, one other final complaint that I have is like, I don't. The Sam, like there's stuff like the the Sandman creation that's bravura, mm -hmm. but the action is sort of not like as next level as it feels in two. I think this is very much uh, a case of them reaching beyond their means. Like 100%. even with the biggest budget in the fucking world, it's weird and all that the this... visual effects weirdly look worse in some ways. Like you, some of the swinging and stuff. Do you know yeah. what I think it is? If I can try to explain this very quickly, <laughs> yeah. So, so often when I watch the Corridor Crew videos. It's just, he, what he means is he's going to take a while explaining I'm not, something I'm not, when he I'm not, says that. I'm not. And he, okay, go ahead. There'll be things where they'll show a scene. And it, it, very often now they'll have like the actual VFX person who worked on the sure. movies. They'll be like, They're our guest today now. is a guy from Weta. And we're yeah, doing yeah, seven yeah. of his yeah, most popular they can movies. get the guys, right. So they go, so how do you do this sequence where the guy deteriorates into sand? How do you make Thomas Hayden Church deteriorate into sand? And their answer is almost always, the whole shot is CGI. And they're like, really? And they're like, you get to a point 
where if you have one live action element and everything else around him is CGI, right. the live action looks worse. Yeah. And it actually is better to just use the thing you shot as reference and just scrap it and recreate the entire thing with CGI. Or at the very least, what they do is they like build a 3D model of Thomas Hayden Church and they take the still image that they filmed of him and they wrap it around. Right. Right. And this is a movie where the compositing is still like two dimensional, where there are like 3D environments with 3D effects, and you have Thomas Hayden Church in like a three day subway station with a 3D train car. And it's, it's 3D, I'm sorry, CGI. Subway station, train car, sand. And the only thing that's real is Thomas Hayden Church. And what they're doing is truly the color form of just like, and just cut him in here. And it does make things feel more disconnected. Like, I think the pure Spidey CGI Venom shit looks good. And I think anytime there's a human face in a shot, it feels more disjointed. All right. I think I agree with you. I mean, yeah, there's just something off about some of the... They're great. Yeah. They're they're overreaching. And right, the Doc Ock fights are so perfect. Anyway. This film came out May 4th. It made 2007. It made $336 million. It made $900 million worldwide. It was the highest grossing film of 2007. And it was the highest grossing Spider-Man film until no way, no, no, sorry, Far From Home maybe? Like, you know. Worldwide. Yeah. Finally, it was beaten by Far From Home. Yeah, I think that's it. Yeah. No Way Home is still the first one to beat it domestically. Right. And like, so like, it's not like it wasn't successful. No. But it is that kind of classic thing of like everyone involved also kind of knew like, hmm, we did definitely lose some public trust on this. Was the opening weekend was 160? The opening weekend, of course, is going to be told to you by me yeah. now. Right. And the answer is 167? 151. 151. Okay. But um, it breaks the record. I guess so. Because Dark Knight breaks that record a year later with 150. Yes three or right. something. Right. If I can just leapfrog for a second here, this was the month where they were like, is this going to cannibalize the industry? You have three huge trilogy enders all coming out like three consecutive weeks. Right. Where it was Spider-Man 3, Pirates of the Caribbean 3, Shrek 3, all came out in May. Mm. And they were like, these are three of the biggest franchises. Each one of them has broken opening weekend records and they're all going to come out within spitting distance of each other. Mm. And then Transformers comes out that same summer as well. Sure. Uh, obviously, Pirates of the Caribbean and Shrek go like, eh, we should do a fourth and like overstay their welcome. Right. Spider Man, they hit the reset button. Transformers is the like wins the summer in the court of public opinion. In a, in a weird sort of a way of else, the blockbusters. Another movie that sort of wins the summer is a film called Knocked Up. Comes out a month later. Yes. In which seeing Spider Man 3 is kind of a plot point. Everyone wants to see Spider Man 3. It is invoked constantly. Yes, it's really funny. Yes. It's actually, I think Judd Apatow just understands that, like Leslie Mann saying, I want to see Spider Man 3 just yeah. sort of sounds funny. <laughs> <laughs> like these grown ups want to see a movie. When they like Spider-Man interview 3. Franco on the yeah. red carpet yeah. for Spider Man 3 or whatever. Yeah. It, it, is, it is funny, but it also was this weird thing of like, he understood the weird power of having that movie come out in the summer and having characters argue about a movie that is playing one screen over. Not some fictional blockbuster, but being like, I know the movie everyone's going to be talking about, Spider-Man 3, and I know when we're coming out. Um, movie did not get great reviews, although it's that kind of like Phantom menace thing where it's like... Star Trek and Darkness. Mildly positive. Yeah. It's just a lot of people being like, hmm, not quite as good, not quite as, like, you know, you know, sort of more like of a 60% on Rotten Tomatoes. Number two in America, I remember distinctly because, I don't know if Please it's been beaten ahead. now, it had the record for the widest disparity between number one and number two at the box office. It made $5 million. It was week four of it's Disturbia. week four of Disturbia. Disturbia. <laughs> Disturbia. DJ Caruso's right. Disturbia is number two at the box Disturbia, office. Disturbia, surprisingly successful, and then everyone knew Spider-Man 3 was coming, so no one released anything of note in the three weeks leading up to Spider-Man, and Disturbia just kept on pulling down very small number ones. And did well. Everyone was happy with Disturbia. Summer of Shia. Uh, it's true. Uh, number three at the box office. Lucky yeah. you? No. That is <clears throat> opening number six. Ooh. Tough. No, but you're right that no, like this is a box office filled with movies that are basically Dumping like, what around. can we dump? Right. Right. In, Sacrificial. Exactly. Yeah. Before Spider-Man. So this is Not a, only that, in the next two weeks, you're going to have two. Like, they were like, we're going to have $300 million plus openings in a row. Um, this is, yes. This is a crime thriller hmm. starring an Oscar winner. Okay. And an Oscar nominee. Okay. 
an old vet and a young buck. Hmm. Uh, it is forgotten. It's a forgotten, sort of like a the recruit esque thing. Yeah. But it's like a legal thriller. It's a legal thriller. It is forgotten. Oh, it is the movie Fracture. Incredible. I think you got that. I would have Fucking never guessed insane. that. I killed my wife. Right. Anthony Hopkins and Ryan Gosling. The tagline for that movie is, I killed my wife. And it's not the one where Ryan Gosling is playing Robert Durst. No. That which is, is all good things. With right? Mary Jane Watson. Kirsten Dunst. Kirsten Dunst herself. Um, yeah. Yes. Uh, but yes, Fracture. Fracture is Anthony Hopkins shows up. Ryan Reynolds, hotshot lawyer, and he goes, I killed my wife. I want you to defend me. And he's like, why is he telling me he killed his right. wife? What's going on? I assume there's some twist. I think he has to prove that he's innocent, even though the guy's telling him that he's guilty or some shit like that. I don't know. Who, fucking Who knows? Gives a shit. Number Fracture. four at the box office is a supernatural teen thriller hmm. uh, made by someone who was hot in the comic book movie industry. Is it uh, David Goyer's The Invisible? Is it Chronicle? It's not Chronicle. It <clears throat> is David Goyer's The okay. Invisible. When is Chronicle? Chronicle? It's 09. Is the, yeah. Yeah, when, maybe a little later. No, it's 2012. 12. That's how old wow. we are. Damn. Wow. Um, no, exactly. It's it's a more forgotten film than Chronicle. It's yeah. The Invisible. Justin I don't Chatwin. know anything, which is a David Goyer movie. It's a Justin Chatwin picture. Uh, yeah. Sure. Yeah. Is he invisible? What's like it about? A ghost or some shit? I don't fucking know. Who gives a shit? Okay, fine. Great. We don't know. I think he's a dead kid and he comes back and he can see people and he solves his own death or some shit like that. David Goyer would write these huge blockbusters and then he would like direct these movies, right? Like this and uh, he did the weird uh, Dibbuk movie with Gary Oldman as a rabbi. Oh, of course. Yeah. The Unborn? Unborn. Yeah. yeah. And uh, he would do interviews with Ain't It Cool because they wanted to talk to him to get like Batman scoops. And they'd be like, so what about this movie? And be like, I don't know. It's like this fucking shit the studios want for kids. I tried to make it really scary, but I can't because the, like he'd be like, I, I'm tying an arm behind my back. These kids eat this shit up. Uh, number five at the box office is a science fiction film. It's based on a short story by Philip K. Dick. Hmm. Uh, a scanner darkly it's not a scanner darkly 2007 it's not a good film yeah unlike a scanner darkly yeah how he- how heavy the sci-fi uh i've never seen it but my guess is somewhat heavy it stars one of your favorite actors it stars one of my favorite actors mm-hmm. as the lead oh he's the lead in 2007 yeah philip k dick oh 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 the movie next next Lee Tom Horry's next next Nicholas Cage Julianne Moore yep. Jessica Biel correct Peter Falk yep. Columbo's in this movie Peter Falk is like he works at like the garage Peter Falk in that movie is called Irv apparently he's like Brian Cranston in Drive He's like, kid, you got to stop seeing what's next. So it's the, he's a magician who can see into the future and this gets him mixed up with terrorists and maybe the FBI. Yeah. Next. Can I ruin the twist of next? Yeah, go ahead. If you don't want to hear the twist of next. Press your skip ahead button. Yeah. So the whole movie is he can see a little bit into the future and so he can decide what the best thing to do is. Right. So like there's a 10 minute sequence where he's at a diner with Jessica Biel and he sees her and he's like, I want to talk to this pretty girl. And you have to watch him run through 10 different scenarios of how to make small talk with her. Uh-huh. It truly goes on for like 10 minutes. Okay. Whole movie proceeds. He gets hijacked by the government. They're like, we want to use your brain as a weapon, whatever. The end of the movie, you realize none of the movie happened and he was just seeing a possible scenario. And he's like, yeah, I'm not going to do that movie. And he gets in a car and drives away. That sounds that's very stupid. stupid. Like everything after the first fifteen that's minutes doesn't dumb. happen, and you're just it's so stu- it is astonishingly it more rude. deflating than anything else. It is yeah. it is like such an insult to the audience. Right. People okay. are like ripping their chairs out. <laughs> right. uh, number six is Lucky You. Which yeah, is- this movie looks bad. I'm not gonna make it. <laughs> right, yeah, that would be funny if it's it's Nicholas Cage at a pitch meeting. Uh, Lucky You is the Curtis Hansen gambling movie with Eric yeah. Bana, right? Which also sat in a shelf for like two years, right? Uh, Drew Barrymore, and, uh, and Robert Barrymore. Duvall. right? Which is is that Curtis Hansen's last? No, he's chasing have, Mavericks. Is he right, have to he, he, right? He got yeah, sick and then he did the HBO things, he which did, is really too good, big actually, to fail. Right? Big yeah. Uh, number seven is Meet the Robinsons, a film I feel like you defend. A movie I think is low key charming. Right, right. Uh, late Disney or early Disney CGI. Like, yeah. You'll you'll watch it with the Boss Baby in like three years. You'll sure. be scraping the bottom of the barrel. That's fine. Doing anything you can to avoid Coco Melon, and you're going to watch Meet Coco the Robinsons Coco four Melon. times. Do you watch Coco Melon? Or we do don't really you? watch anything at home with him. Um, but they he watches at school. Or what does he watch? You know. Uh, 
I don't. He watch. He watches Cookie. I know he's watched Coco Melon. I know he's watched Paw Patrol. Sure. And I always watched Frozen. Oh, Paw Patrol. Don't don't get Ben worked up. We're yeah. trying to end the episode. We can't, can't get, even get started. We on can't that. get Ben crying. Um, Blades of Glory is in the top ten. A big, big comedy hit. hit. Um, Hot Fuzz is in the top ten. Yeah. Edgar Wright's yeah. Breakout ish. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I guess Shaun of the Dead is. We just used a to agree was his worst film, and now there's a movie we actually actually yeah, dislike. There's, there's, a, right, right. there's an actual bad one now, right. uh, or very flawed, I guess. Yeah, I would say. Sure. And then, are we done yet? Is that the sequel to Are We There Yet? Yeah, it was a that's, big box office game stumper Cube? recently. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So, Are We There Yet? The road trip movie with his girlfriend's kids. Are we done yet? He's what fixing up the house. It's a yes. remake of Mr. Blandling's Builds His Dream House. Correct, the Cary Grant film. Yes, yeah. uh, but yes, it's he's trying to fix a house. It's like a money pit style thing. Classic. Yeah. Uh, offensively, this film was not nominated for Best Visual Effects, or maybe not offensively. I just feel like the Sandman stuff should get it the in there. The heights are high, but it, it speaks to, I just think, what a People bad taste. People were out on this thing. Back. Right. Right. Golden Compass wins that year, yeah. and Pirates of the Caribbean and Transformers both are the other nominees, and I guess those might have a better case. Like, it, World's End has incredible visual effects. Incredible. Oh, yeah. And Transformers was kind of doing a thing no one had seen before. But Dead Man's Chest had one. Dead Man's Chest won the year before. Right. And of course, that's the one that introduces David, David Jones, Jones and all, and all that. that. That's really impressive. Michael right. Bay's whole like talking point in interviews that summer was like, I had to make this movie with like half the budget of Spider-Man. Like he was like, I had to be scrappy with $125 million <laughs> and every character in this is a robot. And on that level, Transformers looks <gasps> insane. That is the thing. But the other thing with Transformers is you were just like, how the how the fuck it now it's like yeah sure I know how that's when they work. when then they announced like, they're toys they're right, gonna right. be like talking and shit when they like, announced Transformers yeah. I said that is impossible it's not doable right and how do, can you have that many large characters God, in one movie that's a movie that like I I would just love to go to someone four hundred years from now and be like look at this let's watch this together <laughs> like even maybe a sequel like one of the ones where it's like a bunch of robots are actually having like major conversations right. with each other but that is as you said those movies are bananas oh insane. That is the movie of this summer that Hollywood start taking ideas from. And then the next summer is Iron Man and Dark Knight. And yeah, everything's changed. So Spider-Man 4, uh, of course, was the plan. Mm -hmm. Spider-Man's 5 and 6 were also announced. Yeah. They, they never dates. happened. Uh, David Kep was brought in. James Vanderbilt was brought in. Mm -hmm. Raimi hated the script. Yeah. The studio didn't like Raimi's ideas about yeah. Vulture or whatever. And it all falls apart. But I think it was just the classic Raimi thing where he's like, I am not going to deliver another fucking movie to you until I am satisfied with this script. The, like, what, I'm not doing what we just a, did again. Where I, I like, not, just have to hit it. I date. refuse to apologize for a Spider-Man movie again. Right. Exactly. So either we're doing this right or I'm not doing it. And it got to the point where they said it's too much money. They're too stubborn. And, and part of the Sony deal has always been there has to be a new Spider-Man movie every whatever years. Um, and their deal was always like, in exchange for that, Marvel has 25% of the licensing and the yes. merchandising and whatever. Right. When they make the deal, renew it for the Andrew Garfield movies, the deal becomes Marvel keeps 100% of merchandise. And so Marvel's like, then we're fine. We don't fucking need the movies, whatever. Right. It's when those movies start bombing and the merch sales go down that Feige has to come in and be like, you're tanking the character. Yeah, you're going to The ruin toys this. are no longer worth anything. Right. Um. But the other thing I remember is that when James Vanderbilt gets hired, and he's getting hired the same year as Zodiac. Good movie. Great movie. That uh, they're working on four. Raimi is more hands-on than that. Vanderbilt is like pitching five and six. He's pitching a five and six that they could shoot back to back because right. that's the new hotness that's again cool after thing. Pirates of the Caribbean. But part of the thing was like, he's writing a five and six that if they didn't want to use Raimi and Maguire could easily be rewritten as a yeah. reboot. And so what he's writing as Spider-Man 5, I think Spider -Man pretty quickly becomes Because he wrote amazing. that movie. Yeah. 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 That they movie's start, bad. It's not good. Horrendous. It's not horrendous, but it's I think bad. it's horrendous. Two is worse. Two is worse. But that's also, like, case in point why I will always fight for this movie. Yeah. Because I'm like, is this what you want? Well, now we have Tom Holland. And you just don't. You just think those movies are kind of like, whatever. I, I, I think they're kind of whatever. I mean, my single biggest complaint with the MCU Spider-Man uh, movies, which I guess they're largely fixed is that sort of like i don't know spider-man as like you know a venture capitalist's buddy right as, as just tony sort of, hawk's apprentice right i mean tony hawk <laughs> well, that, tony that would that would whip that, that would be work. Right. that would be great <laughs> where, where tony hawk is like let me teach you how to land a yeah. 1080 or whatever uh, yeah. but 
him as Tony Stark's apprentice, it's just sort of like, it's sort of, it, it kind of doesn't, it misses what I think makes the character unique, yeah. which is that he is an everyman. Like, as soon as you have a Peter Parker who's like smart enough and yeah. cool enough to be friends with like a tech billionaire, it's sort of like what's what's he what's he doing in New York? Like what's he yes. doing why is doing he in still Queens? Peter like, Parker? Why is he still right. Peter yes. Parker? Where is where is that? And so right. sort of like now, you know, No Way Home kind of ends with like, right, and now he can be Spider Man. Now he's finally like, got a shitty you. apartment. He's single. Three like, movies in, but even I here. think that sort right. of misses one of my favorite gags from Spider Man Two is at the. Um, engagement party for Mary Jane Watson and J. Jonas Jameson's yeah. son mm -hmm. and he's Peter's the photographer and he just wants to get a snack yes. and every time he goes to get a snack it right. gets yeah. taken away and I think it's sort of a, a little thing to like kind of put a emphasize the point that the whole deal about Peter being Peter Parker is yes for Spider-Man but you get nothing else you get you maybe, every tie breaks against you right <laughs> basically right, right. Every, every time you reach for something it gets pulled away <laughs> right and your life is learning how to accept that yeah yeah, and I think what I like about this movie Pretty is much. he spends two movies being like, why me? Why can't it be easy? Why can't I have what I want? Right? Like, right. he'll literally say that line in those movies. And then this one, they're like, if you want what you want, Peter? Here you go. And it makes him an asshole. Right. right. And he has to learn, like, no, it's actually good to be humbled. Um, but yes. And it, the, the MCU movies just don't get that at all. It took three movies to get there. It is the thing I find most emotionally affecting at the end of No Way Home is the scene at the donut shop, which is not a perfect scene, but the fact that he makes a very Peter Parker decision of like, I'm going to leave. Yeah. Right? I, I'm not going to rope her into this again as a spoiler for people in what has to be the most spoiled movie in the universe at this point. Um, but yes, this movie is still very much in touch with that. Yeah. And it's still fundamentally just about a couple of kids from Queens. Yeah, basically. Well, yeah. Harry's not from Queens, is he? I guess he's from Manhattan. He's from Manhattan. That kid's from Manhattan. He's from Manhattan. He lives in like D Dakota or whatever. I don't know where they live. Yeah. yeah. Uh, All right, Wado we're done. We, 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 we got to be done. Jamal, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Jamal. This is my first Thanks, episode Jamal. of your show when I have not been talking about something uh, a very serious, a serious film. or heavy. Because you did true. Rosewood, you did Forrest Ali, Gump. Forrest Gump. Ali. A lot right. of like, Forrest Gump, I guess, is the closest to silliness, but of yeah. course touched on every part of America. Right, right, I was right, going right. to say, it's a, a lot of the, the, the sins of 20th century America. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, but so next year is five timers. All right. Ooh. All right. So yeah, what, what, your next appearance has to be has to yeah. be worthy of the five timers club. Or it doesn't. It could be Ernest I mean, Scared Stupid be, for all I care. I don't know. I don't know <laughs> whatever. Like, yeah. That's an Ernest, right? Yeah, Ernest scared, scared stupid. stupid. Yeah. Scared stupid that's the best one. one. Right. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's the best one. Absolutely. Ben, do you agree? Mm, that's tough. I have a soft slave for camp. That one's pretty good, too. Do you remember the year that was the theme at the Met Gala? Ernest goes to camp. <laughs> um, Nobody understood the assignment. They didn't understand the assignment. They didn't understand. They Why didn't understand isn't they just in a gown? I don't yeah. get this. What's She's not going to camp. This Yesterday's was the Gilded Age, yeah. Which, yeah. which was sort of like, I guess people thought the Gilded Age was a good thing. Right. right. I don't know what that was. If I were invited, I would have gone as a sharecropper. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I would have gone... I would have gone wearing a Gilded Age box set DVD with yeah. Carrie Coon's face on it. I don't know. I was like, going to say, I'm checking my notes here. The theme next year for the Mechella is Barry. <laughs> <laughs> Tokyo Vice. What? <laughs> Nobody even likes that show. Um, Jamal, Unclear and Present Danger. Uh, yeah, That's right. I, I have a, I have a movie podcast myself. It's with my friend John Gans. It's called Unclear and Present Danger. We talk about the political and military thrillers of the 1990s and what they say about the politics of that decade. Um, and we more or less watch the movie, like we watch like, you know, TBS Sunday night yeah. movies and a clear and present danger, you know, it's right there in the yeah, title. Yeah. One of those movies. And we talked about them. Um, our last episode, our most recent one was on Oliver Stone's JFK, a buck wild movie. Oh, a very mm. chill. Movie. Um, <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> a popcorn flick. Uh, a movie I love, but yeah. is, is, uh, probably responsible for poisoning the brains of, uh, that's a, the thing a, a you're like, this is so irresponsible. I'm very entertained yeah. right now. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, the best way I can describe watching JFK, if you've never seen it, is it is like uh, uh, getting incredibly high and then like totally vibing and then once you come down from it you're just like oh I have I have ingested something dangerous to my health yes. right right yeah right right I, I never it's yeah it's like a four loco with cocaine in it. Right. So, someone right. needs to be like watching Oliver Stone 
100%. Like, monitor him constantly to make sure he doesn't make a fucking QAnon movie. Oh, God. I mean, he, JFK is a QAnon movie. But, but I'm saying, thing, literally. But, oh. but, but you're right that JFK is the sort of start of that where it's like, you don't understand. It's all connected. Right, man. right, right. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, QAnon yeah. videos are pulling a lot Here, from the here, JFK. Here's Donald Sutherland uh, monologuing for 17 I mean, minutes about the deep state. the yeah. best part of the movie. It is incredible. It is incredible. Um, yeah. So uh, that's the that's the podcast. I hope you uh, listen to it. You can Do you have a Patreon? It. Am I crazy? We have a Patreon. Um, okay. that, I, that, I, I actually, You were considering a Patreon, maybe. I cannot talk about it okay. for reasons related to my day job. Absolutely. Yes. Um, uh, and my day job is I'm a New York Times columnist, and my column usually shows up every Tuesday and every Friday. Always a great read. Always happy to get your newsletter as well. I saw Blanky refer to you recently as the most correct man in America. Wow. And after hearing you talk about Spider-Man 3, I couldn't agree more. That's Thank you so much, Griffin. Too powerful, though. What if, what if you go all emo and you start doing dances down the street? You're, I'm so correct. <laughs> like you're drunk with power. All right. Yes. Yes. Uh, that was Spider-Man 3. Mm-hmm. Tune in next week for... Oh, no, no. The no. next week's good. Next right. week's a good one. I thought next week was Oz, but no. Of course, no, there's no, a good no, one no. in between. I right. almost made the same mistake. Tune in next for... for... <laughs> uh, tune in next week for uh, uh, Drag Me to Hell Yeah. with Jamie Loftus and Caitlin Durante of the Bechdel cast mm-hmm. returning to the show uh, together for the first time. Yep. Uh, Except on their podcast where they're always together. Sure. Uh, first time on this show. Uh, and our Patreon, of course. Patreon.com slash blank check. Yeah. Where we're doing the, the Batman. The not all Batman. Ben's going to sleep. Which we've been talking Sleepy about a Benny. lot in this episode as a comparison point because we recorded it yesterday. Yep. Thank you all for listening. Please remember to rate, review, and subscribe. Thank you to Marie Barty for our social media. AJ McKeon and Alex Barron for our editing. JJ Birch for our research. This was the longest Oscar he ever wrote. There's just so much He's on this He's out of movie. his mind. He's on one. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> thank you to Leigh Montgomery and the Great American Novel for our theme song Joe Bowen and Pat Reynolds for our artwork go to blankcheckpod.com for links to a lot of real nerdy shit and as always the dancing is good dancing's good Some other, there's there's a scene where Sandman turns into a sandcastle, right? That seems good. Where for his daughter or whatever. Yeah. So yeah. it's after Spider Man turns him into mud, and when he reconstitutes, he's like, <laughs> Sandman's so silly. So no, silly. he's not. <laughs> David. Sorry, I'm sorry. He's very serious. Yeah, he turns into wet sand. He's <laughs> he a sure mud does. man, and he then sure he dries out. He turns to sand. It's fucking cool as hell. <laughs>